Hello, everybody, and welcome to our second episode of The Cup, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. I am once again Mackenzie Horner, the panelist chair for this uh, particular episode. I'm joined by friend of the company and returning panelist, Jill. Hello, Jill. Hello, cheers. Oh, look at you. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is in the drink today? So I've actually come quite themed today. Okay. Um, so I, first I'll start with my outfit. I have my little Coriolanus shield earrings, you know, to represent the warrior-esque. I'm also wearing a Roman-esque maxi skirt that you can't see, but... Yes. Just pretend that you can. And then I, can. <laughs> um, I am drinking coffee whiskey by a uh, distillery in Amherstburg, Ontario, which is Ooh. a county town right near my hometown of Windsor, Ontario. Very and good. it is called Wolfhead Distillery. Ah. Ergo, paying homage to the wolf imagery in Coriolanus. Nice. Very good. Very good. We're also joined by the literary manager of Cup of Hemlock, Ryan Barakovich. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Mick. Thanks for having me back. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. What's in your mug today? I have orange Pico tea, same as last week. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we are joined by Edmund Clark, our production manager of Cup of Hemlock. Ed, how are you? I'm doing quite well. Same mug as last time I see. What is in it this time? Uh, this time it's water. I, I mean, if we're if we're gonna do these late, I, I don't want to drink coffee. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And I have my tankard of water as well. Nice, a tankard, two mugs, and a glass. Hey, there you go. I feel there like that's a sitcom go. by like Chuck Lorre right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, in case you haven't read the title of this episode, uh, this week we are covering Robert Lepage's. 2018 production of Coriolanus, which was performed at the Stratford Festival. Uh, it's currently online at the Stratford Festival uh, YouTube page, so you can definitely check that out, as well as a pre-show chat with Andre Stiles, the actor who uh, portrayed Coriolanus, as well as Robert Lepage, the director, and Antin Chimlino, the artistic director, as well as a full cast reunion they did online as well. So there's lots of great goodies on there to go and watch after you've watched our lovely panel. So as we did last time, we'll start with the major question that we start every episode with is, who stood out for this performance? And this time, Ed, we're going to start with you. Okay. Who, who stood out to you? So there, there were two that stood out uh, okay. to me, and that okay. was uh, the gentleman who played Junius Brutus. Okay, uh, Tom McManus. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, no, uh, well, no. Yeah, him too. Uh, he played... Uh, Menenius. Menenius, yeah. Menenius, right. <laughs> yeah, so Menenius and Brutus. Uh, Brutus, be, because I, I just I just really enjoyed his, uh, the form he took on throughout the entire performance uh, with the cane. And uh, just like, just I guess just as, as an actor, there was an appreciation there with his gestures and mm -hmm. uh, just his pleasantry <laughs> in, in his voice, right? He, he really, I mean, amongst all these people who are arguing and yelling and um, you know, it was it was nice to see that there was a that there was a Tribune that was <laughs> that was keeping things pretty tempered. Um, ah, okay. Then, oh, this uh, is Stephen Olmet. This is Stephen yes. Olmet, who, we saw who also last played, week, the, played fool the fool last week. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. He made my yeah. other <laughs> he made my other list of characters for this week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we'll get there. It's mm -hmm. a theme. Uh, yep. And then the other one I I put was yeah. Menenius, 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 yeah. Menenius. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's like Nemo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, he had a very, like, very nice voice. Uh, yes. Very witty with the text, uh, which I really liked, and um, it was rhythmic. He could, he could continue to follow along. I, I will say that his choice, it, it were, or his execution of like rhythms became a bit repetitive uh, at mm -hmm. times to where it was like, okay, we, we get it pretty and kind of grounded. But I mean, uh, overall, I, I was, I was, I was always uh, impressed with the scene. So those he would was be like a true politician. Politicians, yeah, once yeah. they get their stump speech and kind of vocabulary down, they <laughs> don't change it. So he kind of knew. There exactly you go. What Whatever works, say. works. Right. Yeah. It's true. Like, why, why fix it if it ain't yeah. broke? So yeah, those would be the two for me. 
Fantastic. Well, well said. Jill, how about you? Who was your standout shout out of the episode? Wonderful transition because mm-hmm. I um, also thought that Tom uh, Macmiss stood out the best for me as Menenius. Um, mm-hmm. I also think he did a brilliant job of what this production of Coriolanus did is, is tying tradition to modernity. And he mm-hmm. did that a lot in his physicality and his uh, like speech. Um, so he was very, he was such a grounded presence throughout the yeah. whole piece yeah. that was, uh, I think, similar to what we talked about the Fool and King Lear last mm-hmm. week. He, to me, was like a guide in a sense that, um, you know, it was, a, it was a beautiful bridging of, look, look at this text that I'm using, but in a modern sense. And so anybody can understand if you're yeah. Shakespeare literate or illiterate. So, um, and you could just tell he had such experience up there too. And um, yeah, so definitely he, he won that prize for me this week, but I'm Impressive. also a giant fan of Andre Sills and everything he does. So, yes. um, I also thought he, he played really well with like the plosives of his text and the mm-hmm. specific physic physicality he chose towards, um, the relationships he had in, in the show to, mm-hmm. you know, and, and their, the variations, you know, how he interacted with Volumnia, how he interacted with Virgilia, how he interacted with Ophidius. It was so specific mm-hmm. and he matched his text with that too. So, um, again, I had the pleasure of seeing him in an Octoroon and Master Harold and the boys too. And he, oh, Master like Harold. Tom and Hammett's, like he just has that presence and that grounding factor mm-hmm. that, can really lead the way. So he was a close second, but I have to have to give props to Tom for my gotcha. very good first, first prize. Yeah. Ryan, how about you? See, I hate being last on these things because I was also <laughs> gonna say Meninius was definitely a big oh! highlight. But I, I, I think of others, so don't worry. I also kind of in the same spirit that last week I said you can't really praise Lear without praising the star playing Lear who was yeah. You know, yeah. In that case, so obviously, yeah, Andre is the star of this show, and it mm-hmm. is all kind of it, he makes or breaks whether it you know works. But I think I will say an unconventional voice. I think Michael Blake as communist really did stand out to me in a very understated, oh, much like when he was Albany last week in King Lear, which we didn't yes. really talk about much. But he has like just a great way of like filling out the cast, playing those mm-hmm. very important yet understated roles. And yeah, seeing these two in a row really did cement. Yes, I like him a lot. Mm-hmm. He is going to really be in to next there. week's mm-hmm. uh, show of Macbeth, where I believe he or I believe he plays Macduff, if I'm not mm. mistaken. I can he, see that. So he will come back again. <laughs> is and he, he sure right. Edwards company actor? Like he's, on uh, he's one of the few that comes back every uh, quite often. There's a few yeah. principal players at the festival who, my personal favorite, who actually is one of the main principal players, is Lucy Peacock mm-hmm. as uh, Volumnia. Is mm-hmm. that right? Volumnia Ryan? Is that how you say her name? Yes, I've always, Volumnia. Uh, Volumnia, yeah, Volumnia, Volumnia, Volumnia. I've always Volumnia. done like a long U, but I don't know okay. what's correct. Very good. Well, mother, Lucy right? Peacock as yeah. Volumnia, yeah. who is uh, Coriolanus' mother. Yeah. Uh, she was, uh, well, okay, I'm a little biased. I, I actually have worked with her, and she's <laughs> wonderful. Off stage, but on stage, she just crackles. Like mm-hmm. the first time she walks into a scene, which is the weaving scene with yeah. like with like mother, like I, like she plays every relationship wonderfully on stage. Whether it's mother in law yeah. and daughter in law, mm-hmm. or, or you see her totally domineering this poor <laughs> wife of Coriolanus, where she's like all over her, like the total momager. She's kind of like yeah. a Mama Rose of Gypsy, where she just comes in and she just steals the scene. She's in like that whole speech where she's really standing on a table talking down to Coriolanus at the end where it's just her for like 10 With minutes this, this specific uh production too I, I love how she first came out of the the gate with such a boisterous voice too it's like yes. oh volumnia like there's the volume <laughs> yeah. you know like overpowering in a sense that way mm-hmm. and then also just to touch on um the costuming of this production specifically mm-hmm. too in that wonderfully staged um scene with her and Virgilia that we see mm-hmm. um, their first relationship, uh, the contrast in costumes too, you yes. know, like Volumnia had that, she had like the gaudy necklace and like, oh, the, yeah. like draped extravaganza yes. going on, mm-hmm. whereas Virgilia was more tamed. Her necklace was like a tiny crucifix, like, you know, yep. there was, um, mm-hmm. so I feel like Lucy, she did, the, as the actress, she, she married, you know, the, the she, production mm-hmm. value of Volumnia to her, her, yeah. uh, her interpretation of it really well too. 
Mm-hmm. She's fantastic. Like whether like she always comes across as just this power. Like I never, I don't think I've ever seen her play a more quieter character. She comes across as she's just such a powerhouse. The minute you cast her in any role, you know she's going to come on stage and just. I did want her to be a bit more crass near the end mm. and just a bit more ballsy, I guess, and grounded in mm-hmm. her final, you know. Um, speech and off to Coriolanus yeah um that so that fell a little bit flat for me but it, mm-hmm. again it wasn't like distracting in any sense yeah. but I think it's just because I personally that that speech just really gets gets underneath um uh, mm-hmm. my skin in in all the right ways too <laughs> so it's you know I kind of was approaching it with a critical eye anyways but yeah. yeah oh so good I mean the entire cast I mean this was a great cast that Robert Lepage and Nathan Trivino put together for their highlight show of the season because I mean this season you had that that season you had Coriolanus as well as the Tempest with Martha Henry mm-hmm. and so you had two really nice big uh shows that year and both cast are fin- we'll get to the Tempest because that's coming up in a few weeks but yeah, Robert Lepage had a lot of fun with this cast you can tell they worked For sure. really well together but uh as we as we talked about last week there are some characters who just don't hit their mark mm-hmm. and yeah, I mean, I kind of alluded to some of the people who are on my list when, when Ed was talking. So I'll jump. So I'll, I'll, I'll kick us off this time around. But I oh, have yeah, to say, it. I have to say, Stephen Olmet as Janius Brutus and Tom Rooney as Sinus of uh, Valtus. Sicinius. Sicinius. Yeah, yes. yeah Sicinius. <laughs> yeah. So the two of them individually were fine. It's yeah. the fact that together they weren't all that fantastic. They kind of just vanilla it into each other. And unlike... I- other Roman plays where like you have like Cassius and Brutus on stage and they're very distinct characters. I left that show, I mean, after watching it multiple times, I just kind of go, yeah, they're kind of two of the same coin. I don't see enough individualization between them to get yeah, who they enough are. Yeah, contrast between. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I could definitely see that thought, those yeah. two characters played like a very Laurel and Hardy kind of comedy duo mm-hmm. dynamic, yeah. which yeah. we didn't have here. I don't think it's necessarily wrong or bad that we didn't no. have that. But I think, yeah, we could have had more layers to the we dynamic. We could have had more layers to make make it understand. Mm-hmm. Like, what's, so fun fact is the day before, I got to see the, the show the day before they filmed this. And Stephen was actually sick. So he actually didn't come out for curtain call. Uh, for that show. So the next day, that's why he has the cane. It's because he was actually sick. But I, I'm like, oh, the cane actually works for the character. Oh, right, it actually right. fits his character. At least it gives him something a little bit. Because him and Stephen Old Man and Tommy have very similar face, like facial structure, that kind of longer uh, yeah. face. So And they also have, they both are tenor voice. So it's that, it's that thing of like, you can easily interchange them in a mm-hmm. scene. Like there's no real way of being like, oh yeah, that's Brutus, that's Cass. This is kind of like, yeah. Hey, yeah, they're kind of sitting in the office, sitting across from each other. Clearly one is the weaker one, one one is a bit more of the stronger one, but there really wasn't a lot to Yeah, there wasn't too much of a of a difference yeah. between I mean how I mm-hmm. sort of registered the characters in my mind is that they were two tribunes, I I guess representing five tribunes, which mm-hmm. in and all symbolized the people, right? Yeah, yeah. well that's exactly who their characters yeah. are. They're they're, they're meant yeah, to represent so, the people for sure. I mean, yeah. yeah, that didn't see too much contrast between what mm-hmm. they were saying. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. I did like though I do agree with you, Mac. I did like that that um there was never I feel like if if their relationship was a lot stronger and bolder, um I, I like the f- I guess, okay, to spin this into like more of a positive light, yeah. um, they were never challenging. You could tell they were never the same challenger, like on the same level as Coriolanus, mm-hmm. even together, right? So there, as, as I do agree with you, there was, there was a moment where I kept going back on my haunches being like, okay, but they kind of have to be a bit mundane because if yeah. they teamed up together and made Coriolanus equal, it, that wouldn't work out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of both, both had to be schmucky a little bit. You know, I don't know to, like, that, to play that. I don't know if I would go so far as to say that it wouldn't work. It would be a very different dynamic. I think certainly, like in the climax of Act Three, I would maybe have preferred to see them overpower him in a way. But when, mm-hmm. when he does that monologue with I don't know the curs, they the, use the word cur a lot in this play. But That's great. You know, there's just no stopping like Andre when he gets into his element. No, it works, uh, though. which makes it hard to believe that they actually are succeeding at overpowering him in a way yeah well that that's interesting you said that ryan too because another like this is sort of veering off topic a little bit but the timelessness that this specific mm-hmm. production presents with mm-hmm. coriolanus like i felt like i was watching 
multiple different eras and so mm-hmm. much in a sense mm-hmm. that it was a bit Black Mirror-esque as in like, is this mm-hmm. like a post-apocalyptic take on the <laughs> show? Because, yeah. you know, in one scene I'm like, is this like a 1940s war camp that, you know, with the props and stuff kind of alluding to that. And then the next mm-hmm. scene would be like futuristic uh, diner attire or, you know, mm-hmm. so to t- kind of tie into that and that scene specifically too, um, like Andre exuded, you know, the traditional grounded sense of, of Coriolanus, whereas like you're, you know, you're, the guys are wearing suits and ties, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So there's that miscommunication mm-hmm. that kept popping up as well. So mm-hmm. um, it was brilliant, but in a way I kind of had to remind my mind to be like, oh, right. If this isn't hitting a certain way, it's because they're kind of both operating mm-hmm. in different time frames or, you know, like. Mm-hmm. I'd have to say, I'd have to disagree to a certain extent about the, I guess, contention between Coriolanus and the two tribunes because I could see where execution wise that it you know they wouldn't have been able to be on on equal footing with Coriolanus in those moments right it's like Coriolanus is gonna obviously he's gonna take over the scene that's that's <laughs> what it, like his character does um, but I think it plays well and I think maybe if if they had subdued or I guess suppressed their their uh fighting back from uh against Coriolanus that it would have played more into the you know the the that symbolism of people versus government right people versus this right it's like there's they the tribunes know better than anybody else that they can't Mm -hmm. fight Coriolanus or that they can't out yell Coriolanus I think Mm -hmm. if if they had played it even smaller Mm -hmm. where they were they were the more sensible and true, playing yeah. the yeah. playing whatever schmuckiness mm-hmm. that they had, whatever uh, uh, that uh, a bit more strongly that it would have it would have mm-hmm. contrasted well. So I, I mean, the what happened on the in the performance itself, I didn't mm-hmm. necessarily mind. Mm-hmm. I I wanted to I for me I wanted for them to do the reverse. I don't want them to mm-hmm. try to play... find equally equal ground with. Coriolanus it would just never happen in my eyes yeah that would play a lot also into the chat that Andre and Andre Sills had in regards to Coriolanus and Comfiore had in regards to King Lear of putting like a warrior in the position of leadership Mm -hmm. you know it's like they bring their military into civility and it just like doesn't work out the same right like the dialogue Mm -hmm. is not even the same it's not even on the same Mm -hmm. page so Mm -hmm. I agree with you Ed in a sense of them kind of sitting back and sort of words versus actions and sort of letting him go off and sort of be clownish in a sense because it's like there's Mm -hmm. so much miscommunication just because he's flailing around and throwing Mm -hmm. things over you know Mm -hmm. that that would have been uh that would have been an interesting approach for sure i would have liked to have seen more like there's the moment in the senate where you see tom rooney get up to do his banishment speech and you see him slowly but surely look for the look for the handkerchief clean the glass and i'm like you need more of that because that's where the work is there is yeah. there is there the snakes in mm-hmm. the Senate where, where 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 yes they won't get Coriolanus vocally but what they can do is they can needle him enough he was literally he's act out himself testing yeah. his patience yeah yeah but that's yeah. exactly it. and that's what and that's where I'm like that's where those villains worked and I wish mm-hmm. we had seen more of that with them more of that yeah like I I I I, I just slowly but surely them picking. Well, yeah, really, same so with like the dart throwing of, too. You know, exactly. the, the dart throwing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. There, there's there's a little Corey turning. Lane is out in the yeah. battlefield, and yeah. and what his tactics are, and then just going adding to what you were saying. It's like yeah, mm-hmm. seeing more of what the senators use, how they yeah. mm-hmm. get, how they work the system from within. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. So overall, I think they're great individually, but together they kind of just kind of vanilla each other out. Ryan, how about you? Who is somebody you feel didn't quite hit See, the mark? See, I was keeping my mouth quiet during the earlier conversation because I was waiting till now. Quite honestly, Lucy Peacock <gasps> didn't quite hit the mark in my humble opinion. Yes! I, I liked her in other things <laughs> I've seen, but here I honestly thought, like, I, I get it's an interpretation of the character, like the volume is quite clearly in the name, but yeah. just the way that she, like, yelled every single line, mm-hmm. it was... Mm-hmm. Very one note. I think personally, if I was directing that character in a production of this play, I would find a lot more nuance and like subtlety in her. She is overbearing, but just as we were discussing how the tribunes could be 
powerful and sneaky, quiet way. I think there is room for her character to embody a lot of that as well that we didn't yeah. get any of in this performance. Mm -hmm. And like, there is even the scene where I thought this was most bothersome for me was they called it the living room scene in mm -hmm. one of those interviews when, oh, like, yes. you know, she she's arguing with her son and they're like, you know, oh, what's he gonna do? Is he going to, you know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, she hits him yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yes. she hits him, and then she goes off into like the washroom or off stage, and he's continuing the discussion with her, and he's yelling at her, and she's yelling at him. I'm like, <laughs> she was already yelling enough, even when she was on the stage, to put that much space. And like, yeah, she's a wonderful actress, but I think of all the performances in this one, I think so much of this play is hinged on the dynamic between mother and son that, for me, wasn't quite there mm. in this production. I, I I support I support Ryan in, in, in him saying that I think it I think a lot of the characters um, end up yelling a lot and you know Bolomia Bolomia mother <laughs> yes I I think I think mother does kind of there are moments where I don't think it's necessary that she's so loud I think maybe in terms of projection right her voice can certainly stand out and pierce more than than others but. I think to if the goal or that the intent is to have the voice raised the entire time, then yeah, it does become a bit much. See, I would even say that the one moment for me where she actually kind of came close to like toning it down to interesting dramatic effect was in her final appearance in Act Five. Yeah. But something that I also thought was interesting about that wall was she was finally not yelling. Um, the audience was laughing during a lot of that, if at least in this recording of the video. And I think yeah. this is supposed to be like one of the strongest dramatic moments of the play. So if the audience thought it was fun. I'm not sure why they thought it was funny, but I think that's indicative that something has been lost. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe it wasn't enough contrast or because it's so different from how she was, they thought it was comical that she was being that way. I can't yeah. say like, that particular audience, but... I think that that's a sign that something was off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Fair enough. I mean, Ryan will have to agree to disagree because I love <laughs> yeah, yeah. character. But I mean, that's the joy of theater. Theater is all subjective. Mm -hmm. So what one of us may like, another person may go, I saw something totally different. But that is, I love that because I do agree. Sometimes it can go over the top. I think for this character, being the total momager that she is, <laughs> it, it, it sets her up as being that person who you can see throughout their entire, Corlin's entire life, she's been the one that's been managing him and forcing him into situations and yes, yeah, and berating him. Because that's her that, move. Something that maybe, for, mm -hmm. for in my mind, maybe didn't help in selling that dynamic was the fact that Andre just portrayed the character so strong that mm -hmm. I never felt like he was infantilized by her. Right. And that maybe had a lot to do with, so yell as much as she wanted, it didn't, mm -hmm change his performance or demeanor and that right. might have made a big difference and maybe she yeah. wouldn't have had to yell as much if it actually did have a more clear impact on him. Right. <laughs> That's one thing just to talk to that to nod to that I felt Andre's portrayal of Coriolanus was so steadfast in how he wanted to do it which wasn't mm -hmm. wrong by any means yeah. but I felt like because of that and that sort of being the pivotal driving point clearly of the whole production and this one specifically. Mm -hmm. Other actors you could tell were like playing to that as opposed to like playing with that. And I think mm -hmm. unintentionally like their character stuff may have swerved a way that they maybe weren't intending or whatnot, mm -hmm. whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so it's certainly not, it's not like a knock to anyone, but it's just like an interesting thing as an actor mm -hmm. to, to think about, you know. Yeah, very true. Mm -hmm. Very true. Joe, is there anybody else in the cast who didn't feel quite hit their mark? Um, just in contrast to him who we saw in King Lear last week and he was my fave, um, Stephen Omet, he didn't really do yeah. it for me this time around. Cause I do agree with, with the weak um, portrayal of, of Sicinius and Brutus together. But I also found a lot of the times in those scenes, I wanted specifically more from Stephen Omet for some mm -hmm. reason. Like, again, like I get the sort of facet of that relationship he had to play or was trying to play. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just, I wanted, I wanted there to be more, yeah. more meat to that mm -hmm. character, especially because mm -hmm. it's so easy for that character to kind of be 
in the background because yeah. Asinius has a lot more of the specific and you know infamous dialogue in that relationship yeah. too so I thought he could have being the person that he is and knowing the type of actor that he is due to the interview we listened to with Combe, um, how he's, you know, grounded and likes to play mm -hmm. and, and vulnerable and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I just, I didn't see that flushed out in his portrayal of Brutus. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, the next section we always get to is... Oh, what was hold on, on, hold on. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I wait. didn't. I didn't tell you, and I and I needed to say it. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. And fire away. Who was? Who was he agreed with Brian. Yeah. Right. yeah. So that's not your turn. I, <laughs> 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 I get. I get that it's not always the actor's. Uh, uh, I guess choice for their for their character that sometimes directors have an influence on, on how they portray them. But I would say that for me, the actor that or the per interpretation rep. Uh, the character represented the weakest for me was Coriolanus. Oh, oh, yeah. Just, <laughs> I wanted to bring it up because I knew it would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, um, no, fire away. And I think it's and I and I want to say it too because I think if if you're an actor out there who's playing these strong lead roles, and I've played many strong lead roles and have fallen into the same trap of uh, of just playing it very angry and. Mm. And it's uh, overly so, excessively so. Uh, I feel as though there were moments, not, not even moments, I think like most of his performance was just him yelling, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, always trying to dominate. And I think there, as a general, that there isn't just one way of dominating, uh, mm -hmm. you know, especially in a scene too, there's just not one way of dominating. Uh, I just feel like his, the way he tried to dominate each scene was very monotonous. But also that, but also that, uh, not monotone, but, you know, <laughs> just, uh, yeah. but also that it's like, what would have been really interesting to see is that he, is that we, is that we get to see him try within the Senate. Right. Not that, not, not change his opinions on the plebeians or anything like that. And like, he doesn't have to do that. But I think if he had taken a more vulnerable, uh, yeah, I guess vulnerable is a good mm -hmm. word to put it. I mean, he doesn't have to lose his strength or anything, but, mm -hmm. you know, where he's trying to appeal, he's trying to stay in the Senate. Because the thing that made me take note of this, especially, was his scene with, how do you pronounce the uh, name? Alphidius, uh, yes. Yeah, I was just how, thinking that. Yeah. How he showed the most vulnerability for somebody he fought against. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, the, one of the biggest themes in this whole play is, you know, being betrayal uh, and mm -hmm. he's being accused of being a traitor. I feel as though from act one onwards, like Caesar, he he is trying. Right. He, mm -hmm. he is trying to please the people, uh, mm -hmm. uh, even if even if, you know, different from Caesar, he doesn't like the people or anything like that. It's like there's mm -hmm. still this attempt and that and this will play into other notes I have on it, too. but. Uh, but I think the biggest moment where he yells is when he gets to the forum. I right. think that's the loudest point we should have ever seen him get at. Right, when he flips the table. Because yeah. outright, outright, right there, mm -hmm. they, they tell him outright that he's a traitor. Right. That, he, that, that, he's, a, that he's a tyrant. Uh, mm -hmm. And, like, that's the thing that he, you know, uh, what is it, uh, scolds the most, right? Is right the, is like how dare you call me a traitor mm -hmm. so i think mm -hmm. there are just too many moments too many scenes with him up here when mm -hmm. there should have just been one mm -hmm. right some of the most tender moments and this plays into his physicality uh were his moments with virgilia yeah yes. like that's where mm -hmm. i was like Ooh, like there's. Ooh, I will there's add. The it's Andre, a very underwritten the character. Other sides of yeah, yes, yes. of Andre Sills. I want, um, you know, like the tender. Because again, seeing him in other things, like I know that he has that that swing mm -hmm. to him for sure. That is breathtaking to watch. So that's why I'm I'm wondering if this was more like a directorial yeah. thing to have him mm -hmm. be like quite literally the head of the piece. Hello, it right. starts out ahead, right? Like, uh -huh. yes, um, <laughs> but uh, it was yeah, like the way he would interact with someone like Virgilia and stuff like that, that, that was the swing. Yeah. I, I would agree. I, I wanted that more in his relationship mm -hmm. with Aphidius too, you yeah. know, like little tiny pockets of 
of that too. So you're not. Uh, well, his writing with Ophidius yeah. is interesting. Like, well, one, that's just even on the page, it's a very homoerotic scene that this mm -hmm. production leaned into hard. <laughs> um, on a, I will argue, though, on Ophidius's side, but at, not at all on Coriolanus's. Yeah, which is interesting, the, mm -hmm. the asymmetry of that. We'll pattern. get into that scene. I have no. I, I was going to say, we better <laughs> unpack that. Yeah. We <laughs> will. We'll get there. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think there the, you know, even if they didn't even if he was up here, the director wanted him to be up here. I I think what would have been a bit better is if he was somewhere lower and then people the the characters around him adjusted below. I mean he is the titular mm -hmm. character, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, he is the mark <laughs> with yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, that's my, that's my, my I agree. I have to agree. Like, there's the campaigning scene where he's going door to door. And the whole time he was angry. Like, even with that wonderful I, for, 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 for I, scene by I will say Wilson. With the that, was, that was my favorite language. scene of the show. Though. Me too. Like, one of them at least. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I loved, like, the, the citizens that were, like, yeah. how they were portrayed. portrayed like, it was, like, yeah. the, the couple of the older man with the younger woman. Yeah. Maybe she yeah. was his daughter. I don't know. There was the the old man with the nurse, the yeah. ASL interpreter. Like I just thought yeah. that was pure gold. This it was where I, I feel like this production. This again, I'm probably advancing, but You're did hit the did hit the mark. Mm -hmm. in, in in contrast to to the whole um, idea and theme of homelessness in King Lear and how we flush mm -hmm. that as oh, being yeah. not yeah. Sorry, so thing. Right. It was scenes like like. Yeah. this in Coriolanus that I was like this is this is like a beautiful here's an old piece of text and tradition and we're tossing mm -hmm. it into like a modern political context that is yeah. working. Yeah. See yeah. something I will even add to that is I think it's very interesting the way this production deals with the, the people which I'm saying in air quotes but they're it's a lag so they're coming up late. <laughs> 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 but yes the people uh because something that i noticed because so whenever i watch like a shakespeare production of any kind on my computer or at home i'm able to follow along in my complete works here right. whereas i can't do that in the theater so i if i was seeing this production live but just i had it just mm -hmm. like open in front of me i wasn't reading along just following the long mm -hmm. scene like and i thought it was very interesting the way that so many scenes in this play have like little interludes of like the the common people talking to each other getting their perspective and so many of those are actually cut from this yeah. production which i think is a very important part of this show that you wouldn't notice was gone just watching it <laughs> but yeah the fact that like scenes like that was the best anchor we had to those missing elements the other one that comes to <laughs> mind was the was the two <laughs> texting each other, Matthew, you all right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the two sentinels texting each other. Oh, that's really I love that. Hilarious. Yeah, so like every oh, time yeah. that they did keep a moment, and like the one with the waiters also, every time they did keep yeah. a moment <laughs> of the citizens talking to each other, it was always very memorably staged, but I thought it was strange how many of them were cut completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, it worked. Uh, it worked. It totally worked. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next section. <clears throat> Is what was our favorite design element of the production? You know, I think you want to lead this one. Me? There's yeah. there's so many. Um, so I had the privilege of seeing this actually at Stratford as well. As did I, um, yeah. So and I basically sat the same view as the the filmed version. Oh, whereas very good. I went with a group of folks that um, we couldn't sit together and they sat in the balcony. And That's their experience of the show was very different from mine mm. um, because of the whole like filmic aspect of it. Right. They, were, they really thought they were like, I was never transfixed because I was uh, like looking down on mm -hmm. a film, which is odd. Mm -hmm. Like I should be looking mm -hmm. at a film. Mm -hmm. um, so I enjoyed seeing the production again, mm -hmm. virtually in the same um, mm -hmm. view and it being actually like I'm watching a film because it's mm -hmm. so meta and there's so many different layers now. Yeah. Um, my, I know it kind of got a bit gobbledygooked with scene transitions, but I think I'm gonna have to say the projections to me. My, are, that was my shout out. Really like my fave. I just think yeah. like the intricacy that was done to them was was so beautiful to see. Yeah. Like the tapestry, um, mm -hmm. the the photographs they chose to do in, in the the pub and the the restaurant. Um, mm -hmm. The whole contrast of 
um, Coriolanus's drive, you know, and like entering oh, um, Antium and sequence. just, it just always, it, it was so filmic in a sense of like, oh, yeah. this is the setting. This is where we are now. And it was mm -hmm. exciting. Like, it was like, mm -hmm. oh, I wonder where they're going next, what they're going to get me next. Yeah. So I think that really, um, that was brilliantly done. And, and the mm -hmm. fireworks, oh my gosh, when mm -hmm. Aphidius is sitting, sitting on the windowsill, the windowsill. And, and you just see the little, or even when they're in the, the sharing the conversation in the bathhouse and you see oh. shadows of people walking on the street yeah. and like yeah. the detail like the dramaturgical detail mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. a plus 10 out of yeah. 10 so i have to agree yeah me. projection yeah projections were, that, were my yeah. note as well mm -hmm. that is why you hire someone like robert lepage to do this production because <laughs> yes. he made his name in projections yeah. on that yeah. note Very much if, so on that note if i could go next i think yes ryan please similar take it away. in line with projections but it's just one scene in particular that i want to talk about and that's the what car scene? yes the everybody car. like that that was the big note that everybody came out after seeing the show was you yeah. have to go see the show just for the car scene like it's, it's just so, it's so simple it's so simple yeah. but very oh, brilliant yeah. just having a static car on stage the wheels yeah. are yeah. in place but spinning and just the projection does all mm -hmm. the movement and like yeah. andre's face sells it too because he's like really yeah. into driving but <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah like that image alone it, yes. is I, I was very pleased with that. It's partly projections, but I think the set also has a big mm -hmm. part. Just tiny nod to the helicopter yeah. scene. The transition oh, yeah. into that scene was stunning. Like mm. the movement. Yeah. I was I was entranced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good use yeah. of vehicles or automobiles. I loved, in this, in this I loved on the car the projected little beads of rain going across mm -hmm. the strategy yeah. of the rainstorm. I was like, ah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so much great detail, yeah. and, and you're right, that is exactly why you hire Robert Lepage, for the, if you're going to do a modern projection interpretation of Coriolanus. Uh, on a similar note, though, I would say that they also did the, the classic Lepage thing of having, you know, cameras on stage projecting directly, like, live on yeah. stage, which yeah. I thought was not very effectively used in this production mm -hmm. just um like they only really use it in two noticeable moments for in me the yeah, well, in the senate yeah yeah one else. of them was in the senate and the other was when young martius was just playing with his action figures and right. Right. i didn't feel like either one of the uses of this device in those particular scenes added much it was just hey look we got a page <laughs> in my opinion which like, there was enough it's his signature, other, right. there was, it's there his was signature. enough else of for me, noticeable style that i didn't think we needed it mm -hmm. yeah yeah for me the senate camera work made sense because it was like kind of like c-spin where it's like that really boring static yeah. cameras where it's really just <clears throat> plunk a camera in the room and just you want, like the old people at home are going to be watching it, like, wa like watching the Senate do its thing. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, that makes sense. They would have a camera like, in there. Yeah, I'm not but, saying it doesn't make sense. I just didn't yeah. think it added much, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it didn't. It didn't. Like you're, like, you're, like sometimes I remember seeing that scene on stage. I remember more more than once because because the acting kind of was, you know, as, as Ed said, it was very much the same yeah. level the whole time. Where I was like mm -hmm. looking at the screens now to be like. What are they catching on the screens that, I, that that we're supposed to be seeing? And that time it was like, oh, they're just watching too. Yeah. So, the thing so that I that. loved from from mm -hmm. like a meta point of view of watching, so the the idea of young Martius playing with his action figures, mm -hmm. and then you see, you know, it's no longer the figure; it's literally the yeah, Ophidius shows up yeah. and exactly in the wings. Yeah. I remember like watching that through a tailored lens that mm -hmm. YouTube shot for via youtube is giving yeah. us yeah i got goosebumps because it was like mm -hmm. ooh, like we're infringing on that moment whereas mm -hmm. in the theater i had i was still sitting in a theater watching a stage watching that screen mm -hmm. whereas right. that moment was more like tender and personal mm -hmm. for me watching it this time around because it's mm -hmm. only the only thing i had to rely on it was the screen you know yeah. so mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of different mm -hmm. con like that's a totally different conversation too but yeah for sure. Ed, how about you? What was your production shout out? Anything that, anything that fell under set. <laughs> like the, <laughs> anything and everything that fell under set. It, it was, yeah. uh, and, and I, had, I, yeah, I had seen a, a Nightingale by Igor Stravinsky, directed by Robert Lepage in, at the Canadian Opera Company. Mm -hmm. And it was very similar, like, I mean, it's just uh, just like it, when I when I was watching the film, I was like, "Wow, I feel like I was <laughs> like I was back at mm -hmm. at uh, Nightingale." Just like not in terms of like the same themes and aesthetics and whatnot, but just in like the fact of how he used the set 
for how he used the space is just so I, I'd never mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. have a very traditional yeah. proscenium, yeah. you know, curtains curtains yeah. open, curtains closed when it's time, yeah. right? So Something, seeing, seeing that, I was just like, wow. Yeah. Something I would even add, and it's such a minor detail, but I, I was there for it, was all the scenes from the bar ended yeah. with the actual bar rising into the sky and then oh, the yeah. person walk out into whatever the next scene was like yeah yeah that just such a slight detail like they could have just had it on wheels and moved it away but no they yeah. had to have it raise into the sky yeah. yeah i love the i love the design of it too because it i think it blends the i think it blends perfectly the you know that aesthetic of the of a ancient Rome with mm-hmm. you know like the modern modern mm-hmm. times like I, I noticed it when I was in, when they were in the when I was in the bathhouse when, when <laughs> I was transported to the bathhouse and they had the you know Roman arches but in the glass the glass was a uh, very sort of modern spa mm-hmm. what, what you would see yeah. you know uh, opaque squares mm-hmm. cubes yeah. uh, mm-hmm. and i thought wow that's that's so mm-hmm. and then uh, Corey Lanus's house uh when they were weaving the, the uh, tapestry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh my god and, and mm-hmm. yeah there his house his house as well with the statues and mm-hmm. the paintings in the back i was like oh wow this is amazing clearly designed Especially, by his mother <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, uh, yeah, no, obviously. And especially the statues. I, I wanted to mm-hmm. like, pay homage to that when the statues, like Aristotle, mm-hmm. I think yeah. Apollo, maybe even, or, or maybe uh, mm-hmm. another like uh, mm-hmm. uh, Roman emperor, but when they're all looking down at Coriolanus mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. at his spot, I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, there was a lot. part of me that wanted, that wanted them uh, before I took note, before I took that, like, took that in uh there was a part of me that wanted them to play around with like the statues but then i mm-hmm. saw that they were that the statues were in fact looking mm-hmm. right at coriolanus mm-hmm. uh and i thought oh wow that's that's mm-hmm. that's clever that's i will say being a bit nitpicky with <laughs> yeah. the black flies into mm-hmm. the scoping of yeah. things and the bar and such yeah this is so so nitpicky but because there were moments that it was executed so beautifully mm-hmm. the moments where it wasn't i was like mm. was like, there a moment that so, to you yeah so two um so the bar lifting up the minute that it lifted they did do a beautiful transition with that and i was looking for i was like okay great clocked every time that that's blown like flown in mm-hmm. flying it out they're gonna have to find a way of making it skedaddle but they mm-hmm. didn't sometimes and kind of mm-hmm. just left and then like a transition was happening behind it and I was like "Ooh, mm-hmm. they should have used like you know I think one of the the transition that I was alluding to with the helicopter that was the whole de- idea of like the bar going up and they like went with it and now it's the new scene yeah, whereas right. there was another one where they were just shifting a whole shift of bodies and even right. place I think and the bar just kind of left and I was like, ooh. And then another thing that was interesting to me too is when um, at the end, when Blumnia, Valeria, um, Virgilia and um, baby Martius comes in, um, they, they didn't, they don't raise, like I I could see what was happening. Like you, you couldn't see the actor's face. It it clearly was a choice. It just, I guess to me, it didn't, it didn't uh, bode well just because they enter and it's not, you don't see them until they kneel, which like, I understand, Mm -hmm. I get that of being like, you don't want to see them until they're kneeling. I can kind of understand Mm -hmm. that, but it just, it wasn't strong enough for me to be like, why wasn't it raised to encompass that whole frame from the get go, you know? So, Mm -hmm. and you know, in certain things of like, why, usually the the closing in the scope made Mm -hmm. flushed out for me. But again, Mm -hmm. sometimes I was like, I want to unpack like why you're closing in on that moment or that See, person. Uh, it's funny that you say that because I was saving that for my moment of the production that didn't really do it for me. I wasn't in love with those zooming in. It felt mm-hmm. very like the end of Looney Tunes cartoons to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the, but like the, the one that for me kind of, you know, was the, I not necessarily the least impactful, but the one that I think was the most troublesome for me was just the very last one where, you know, Coriolanus is dead and we're going to uh, linger on just Ophidius for yeah, like, wait, was right. it his tragedy? I know what he's not. Like, the, is he next? Is, and like, that was very yeah. slow too. That yeah. one was very like. Yeah. Like the final stage direction is like exit the 
obsession with Coriolanus's body. That's what it is in the text. And we don't hear in this production end on Coriolanus's body. We barely even mm -hmm. see his body from the moment he gets shot. Yeah. That is just, no, Ophidius is sad. Let's look at that for like a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, I, I didn't do it for me in my opinion. Yeah. Well, must I say though, sorry, just rolling back on that moment, the gunshot. And yeah, let's talk about blood. Matt, can we talk about this now? <laughs> um, uh, uh, well, I mean, are, are we where, where are we going? Head. Because, because we're about to head into the production song that didn't work for us. Is, Ron, well, is that I, where you're going? Or, I've or said you wanted to already, so we're ahead of schedule. Jill, continue. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that Stop moment it is, because it is in my notes for a moment. Okay. Actually, yeah. actually, it's in my next moment, the weakest parts oh. of the production. So there we go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, <laughs> because for me, one of the biggest things I felt was there are certain times where, the, like, where the projections didn't work, mm -hmm. and the headshot was one where I was like, it was very clearly a projection, and it mm -hmm. kind of just happened, and there was no way to like have uh, what's his name, uh, the other, um, not Coriolanus, the gun, the one that's Aphidius, Aphidius, thank you, Aphidius, mm -hmm. where, where where like he comes across where there's no blood on him. And I'm like, but he just had a dead body, and this means such a yeah. really grounded production. We're like, you're expecting to see some yeah. type of blood or violence, and it comes out of nowhere, which is, gets to my next point of the direction of that scene. What I'm scene? Like, Sorry, what scene are you? The reading? final scene. This, this, oh, this yeah, is yeah. a shot to the head scene. Right. Where, where, where I go, where I go, it, I, I would much rather have them just shoot Coriolanus in the back versus in the head, because mm -hmm. at least then it would have been like a major blood spot where, like, clearly you can see um, Andre still has no blood on his face because his head is hanging over the side of the bed and I was like directorially the moment also came out of nowhere where I was like what is happening like I remember seeing that on stage I I, I was I wasn't overly familiar with it I'd seen I'd seen the the Ray the Ray the, the Ray Fines and um Gerard Butler film mm -hmm. so I knew he was gonna die but I didn't expect it to be like that quick and I was like oh I forgot how dramatic that moment was but the headshot out took me out of it for that moment I was like so ultra violent but yet they didn't follow through with the concept enough to hit that final Moment you wanted the there to be more of a meditation after mm -hmm. he was killed as well. I yeah. feel like all the other players on stage, including Aphidius, jumped mm -hmm. right into, well, that's done and now I'm speaking again. Like, yeah. there, there wasn't enough ramification of yeah. the deed that was actually mm -hmm. done. Yeah. Um, so much so that the beats mm -hmm. following that, I kind of couldn't focus because mm -hmm. I, I was yeah. too actorly brained being like, this something didn't resonate or like yeah. why but, and i think i have a theory for why that is that okay, it didn't Ryan. resonate here I, theory go well i don't know big theory might be pronouncing too much of it but in the text the stage direction in which coriolanus is killed is that the conspirators plural attack him mm -hmm. And the way it was staged here was just this one random lieutenant who we've seen in a few scenes, but he doesn't have a name. He doesn't really represent yeah. the mass yeah. of people. But mm -hmm. so much of the conflict of this play is Coriolanus versus the people to just have this one random and just shoot, shoot him in the back of the head and, oh, it's done. And I guess Ophidius is taking the blame for it. So it was kind of both of them. But it was yeah. really, it was like it was just this guy, Ophidius, was going to just wrestle him and they would work out their differences maybe if things right. had gone otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I needed more of like a character build from that, yeah. that sort yeah. of individual embodying yeah, and he was in a few of Dean's prior, like in the camp, but like it, He was Ophidius's lover, wasn't he? Like he was Yeah, I, I yeah. Was yeah. So he, he clearly was, but I, I needed mm -hmm. that and I get it wasn't supposed to be like necessarily in your face that he was, but mm -hmm. because he they in this production chose him to to, to do it alone. Do Coriolanus. Yeah. I needed I needed that to come from a place of love yeah. or you know or hate. And, I think Ophidius and, should have done it. If you're gonna change things up, like have Ophidius do the killing blow. Yeah, yeah. that would that would have been good. Like during like during like during their fight where it's almost accidental, but it's like, oh crap, oh we did that. <laughs> yeah. For that to happen. So, so yeah, that, that final death of Coriolanus can't just didn't click. I, I do should. think, though, that this Ophidius, sorry, Mac, if this is jumping, though. No! Like, the ahead. way that this Ophidius was played, though, mm -hmm. was a, li a little bit more sensitive or mundane yes. or, mm -hmm. or um, you know, like, he definitely, Coriolanus couldn't shut off the military mm -hmm. vibe. Like, mm -hmm. it was his way or the highway sort of thing, yeah. quite literally, yeah. when he's driving on that beautiful <laughs> scene, <laughs> that beautiful scene. Um, but with this Ophidius, um, I thought Graham did a wonderful job with it, but it, it was mm -hmm. just, it was nice to see that, you know, he could be the soldier, but there was, there was still like a gushiness 
yeah. in him a little, if yeah. you can even say that. Mm -hmm. um, so so, like that. so much so that he made that a strong enough choice that I don't think it could warrant him actually killing Coriolanus because I truly mm -hmm. think he really did love Coriolanus. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I understand why the lover did it. I just needed yeah. more groundedness more in him, yeah. like yeah. in that character. Mm -hmm. and you know? Replacing yeah. that with the single one guy doing that shot which almost mm -hmm. seems like not an accident but just like uh, uh oh got a chance gonna take it it doesn't seem like the yeah. calculated planned mm -hmm. conspiracy of the text right. yes you know what i'm i'm gonna like with what you said mac about you know the ultra violence of the play mm -hmm. i'm willing to when i was watching it i, I didn't really mind it all that much i mm -hmm. i'm willing to suspend my disbelief whenever it comes to theater uh mm -hmm. i i do i do agree with you um I'm not saying that I don't, uh, mm -hmm. but I do agree with you. I think that's something like a director should. I, I mean, maybe he knew it. Like maybe that's mm -hmm. that's he's okay. Like that for that moment, we like mm -hmm. we'll we'll just you know make believe whatever, <laughs> where everything else is just bloody bloody bloody. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, no, I, I think I think for one of those moments for me, I was like, okay, I will just write that off as suspend my disbelief. That is mm -hmm. like the gamble of going in with hyper realism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah, especially with like that locker room scene in the first part of the play where you mm -hmm. really see him drenched yeah, in it, blood. We're, 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 blood. we're like, okay, it, yeah, I'm, I'm like, if we're yeah. going that route, then if you're going to do a headshot, it sets a give me some of that blood yeah. afterwards because that's yeah, what There that is moment. something though to say that, you know, the idea of him actually dying once and for mm -hmm. all is there's no blood shed in, in mm -hmm. quotations. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, that I mean, it's a deeper way of thinking of it. Hopefully, Lepage would be like that. That a girl. That I'm saying. Yeah. He's like, yes, you. you uh, I think if that's the more. case, though, that we didn't need the projection because the projection yes. is still creating the blood. Well, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I so did that, think it was a cool moment. I, I, I was like, whoa! Oh my God, mm -hmm. That was pretty mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. It was like, yeah, it was but like it was a head just, a head a moment. I was like, ooh, the gun yeah. shot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. people uh, don't do such things. A, <laughs> yeah, it, it was a spectacle moment, not a real yeah. consistent. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, yeah. I I will say overall, like some of the directing, I felt like don't get me wrong, Lepage, great mm -hmm. conceptualist, but there were moments where I felt the direction and the acting lacked, and that, and it was almost like, okay, well, if the directing's gonna lack here, then at least then I have the projections to look on in the meantime to distract right. you where I'm like we could have had a yeah. little bit more of the acting directing take it up a notch where it's like add in that layeredness for for for, mm -hmm. for like Volumnia or for Coriolanus and maybe, maybe don't focus so much on your projection for that for, 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 for that's interesting though because that in in the discussion that he was having with Anthony mm -hmm. uh Robert who's saying that yeah. a lot of the the stimulation for this piece was mm -hmm. a very open dialogue um an equal understanding of the play and the characters itself mm -hmm. which as an actor like I respected him saying this so much because there's nothing you love more than working with a director who like has their view and opinion but mm -hmm. knows that like at the end of the day, it's the actor's interpretation and view and opinion yep. that needs to be honored and or mm -hmm. be like their interpretation or mm -hmm. to be the host of your vision. And yep. so I just remember him specifically saying, you know, in, um, he actually, I actually, I actually have it written down, like actors know more about the script than you do. So yes. be open to that and let that in and let the actor's ideas mm -hmm um hold weight and that was kind of like a playful process that he had yeah. directorially mm -hmm. so i get what you're saying um and i do think there definitely are moments where it was like you know was this just the actor's fruition or was this yes. just a, a a directed thing that mm -hmm. didn't necessarily coincide with the yeah with the actors but mm -hmm. um yeah i just i i i really appreciated his his yeah. little comment mm -hmm. on that and how it was very sort of a give and take process mm -hmm. um yeah. yeah do we have any other parts of the show that didn't quite work for us production wise i would say the costumes oh the costumes oh you know I think, I, I think everything was pretty strong mm -hmm. uh but i would say the costumes like <laughs> nothing really popped out there was mm -hmm. one costume actually that popped out which uh, one? That, that was the, ninth, the the 90s music video 
do rag wearing Coriolanus. <laughs> oh. And I was like, I what era are we in? in? Do we need to know that we're not yeah. in an era? Like, I, thought, I thought it was a 90s rap video. Where, and then he's driving in the car, and it's like, yeah. I thought, you know, Tupac may have been playing yeah. in his kind of stereo. <laughs> like, that's, a, that's what I was thinking the entire time. I thought, this is a cool scene. California but this, love the, me. The, yeah, right? It's like it's a gangster paradise. Uh, he's like the do rag, really. <laughs> but uh, I, I would say the costumes, like there just wasn't anything that kind of popped mm-hmm. for me yeah. that I saw. Mm-hmm. But uh, mm-hmm. outside of everything else, like the lighting and the set and the projections mm-hmm. and the video, like I mm-hmm. thought that was all. Maybe that just took away from what I wasn't seeing with the, with right. the costumes. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, Ryan. I, I, yeah. I, oh. Go ahead. Ed. No, 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 no. I was just gonna say I did. I did like that. This goes back to the other question. I did like the sound. I, I want to say that. Oh, the sound. Is, yeah, yeah. The sound it's was like very, very well done. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. The sound. Yes, absolutely. The sound was fantastic. But Ryan, I'll let you lead off on the next question, which okay. is: as our resident TA of our of our panel today, do you think this production hit the market? Is it worth watching, or in your case, showing a class? I think. It depends on what the purpose of the class is, I guess. I think if this was just like a Shakespeare class or theater Mm -hmm. history survey class, Mm -hmm. I would not necessarily want this to be the first Coriolanus production to show the students. I think, Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you saw the Tom Hiddleston National Theater Live one from a few years ago. Yes, I did. I I watched it online. It was very good. Yeah, that that I think is like a lot closer to kind of like what I said about King Lear last week, this Mm -hmm. like more faithful so to speak yeah. or just like an authentic you know, this is a, doing a straight version of it still mm-hmm. very well done well acted well staged right but i think in this production the director was the star and he's just showing off what cool ideas he had nothing wrong with that that's not his trademark and i've been a fan of his work for a long time mm-hmm. but i think when I say that depends on the type of course, I think I would love to show this production to like a directing class or a yeah. design class. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like this is what we can do with Shakespeare. We don't have to, you know, hermetically seal it within its own time period, its mm-hmm. own, you know, antiquated yeah. yeah. dressings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So I, it depends on the type of class. I think yeah. this is a great production and I would be happy to show it to others, but depends on the context. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and I, and I think that's where the production hit the mark is it very clearly shows, especially for directors, where it's like, this was like Robert Lepage's Robert concept of like modernization technology, the idea of a man, like, like one man being in the reach of huge form through media, a whole concept in the people and modern politics, how you can interlay mm-hmm. that. And then you see that beginning concept to the final filmed version of it. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that exa- exactly, and I think that's where you would show this. But I do agree with you. It, like, like, if you're going to try and introduce, like, in a high school, this may be a cool idea to show them yeah. a, like, a few scenes trying to be like, look, a different yeah. way of a, adapting this. But I would definitely go for a more national theater live uh, basic production if you're going to be showing it in, like, an acting class or a, mm-hmm. or, a or, like, a Shakespeare generalized class where you, this is the play you've chosen to study. Mm-hmm. Just to give everybody a more general idea of what's close to what Shakespeare probably would have imagined is mm-hmm. <laughs> to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jill, how about you? Yeah, I um, I agree with Ryan in a sense mm-hmm. from from a textual, uh, you know, really digesting the themes and um, texts of of this play. Uh, mm-hmm. It may not hit the mark, but I think something that totally outweighs that is that these are the types of Shakespearean productions that need to be happening now, in my opinion, more so than the latter, especially now in the middle of the pandemic, the whole idea of live theater is drastically going to change and become more media friendly, whether we like it or not. But my whole, I do have like a mandate as an artist myself is I think it's very important as actors, as directors, as dramaturgs, what have you, to take traditional texts and not throw them out, not neglect Mm -hmm. them, but augment them and make Mm -hmm. them more modern in a sense Mm -hmm. that will, especially with Shakespeare or texts that might be more foreign Mm -hmm. to um, today's society, um, make them easy to, easier to digest, you know, Mm -hmm. don't hand feed them per se, but something like this where anybody could come and see this production and just be entranced and Mm -hmm. quite honestly be like, you're watching a film, which I, you know, I do have experience with Shakespeare, but if, you know, someone like my brother who 
personally despises Shakespeare. I know he <laughs> watched this production and actually understand what's going on mm -hmm. and be stimulated by other facets of the show that, you know, he yeah. could kind of put the text. I think a lot of folks still think that Shakespeare has to be like weighted, heavy, boring language at people outside of the theater realm specifically. Um, and so there's a bad taste in their mouth going into it, whereas a production right. like this um, hits on so many levels of it being like, no, it is not that stereotype. It is also showcasing like modern day politics, um, mm -hmm. modern day like societal norms, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's showcasing the, the whole idea of blending together media and live liveness you know and yeah. how that is sort of a new art form um so i think it was a really good in like encompassed sort of but yet you still had you know the the meter you still had yeah. people hitting their plosives you know like mm -hmm. I, I always always heard andre hitting like uh hitting his mm -hmm. c's you know crom and kai yeah. occurs you know and the whole mm -hmm. like there's yeah it's 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 definitely a tool that hits on so many different things mm -hmm. and in contrast i guess to king lear just for sheer fact of we did that last week yeah. um i think this one i would want to show over something like that because there's mm -hmm. just so many different avenues you can take on this mm -hmm. um yeah which yeah mm -hmm. taking the tradition and not neglecting it but making it more modern that's yeah. that's the way that's going to be the way of, of the theater world at least so yeah um mm -hmm. yeah so yeah here here <laughs> Joe, so Joe, i totally see where you're going with that i like that all right ed how about you did this production um, hit its mark i i do think it, i mean whatever mark it was trying to hit i think it, it did uh for the most part i I agree with both Jill and Ryan about, you know, the sort of classes it, it would be mm -hmm. like well uh, done at. Um, and then also the fact that I, I would introduce this play before I introduce King Lear to somebody who yeah. hadn't seen uh, Shakespeare or wasn't yeah. even in the theater world, right? I will say as much as I agree with Jill about you know the where where theater is heading in that there is definitely going to be a mesh of media and the stage and live performance moving forward after after this um pandemic um but i, I as as much as i agree i i, I am at heart a, a bit of a purist when it comes to shakespeare <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i don't want to make shakespeare easier for people i mm -hmm. i mean i'm not a, the biggest fan of no fear shakespeare i think you know, people who come to see Shakespeare, they come for what everything Shakespeare is. Uh, right. But that's that's one part of me. I do, mm -hmm. I do. You know, uh, like I understand the, that there is an accessibility that needs to happen mm -hmm. with Shakespeare, and that mm -hmm. you know, it is. It doesn't always have to be the case where mm -hmm. rely heavily on on the language. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you know, I, I'm always just satisfied whenever I hear that there is a play happening and mm -hmm. whatever context it's happening in. I mean, whether I agree with it or not, I'm just glad to see that Shakespeare is still being put on and that yeah. it's mm -hmm. still being heard. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I do think this production for the most part hit the mark. I, I think it's worth watching. I would definitely show my friends. Um, definitely. Uh, but yeah, yeah, definitely show my friends. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah. what I'd say about that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, wonderful. Mac, oh. what about you? Well, I, I, well as I said, I, I agree with Ryan where I think this definitely hit its mark where it's that beginning of concept to end of concept where you show to people and go this is what the director's job really is it's their job to shepherd a concept they believe from point a to point c point z where yeah. it's dead this is for canadian <laughs> uh where's that whole thing of roberto posh had this concept back in 2016 yeah i think he said in his interview where it's like modern day media meets coriolanus and then mm -hmm. he workshopped it twice in, in quebec if we're bringing it to Stratford and it's something Anthony Chilino shepherded with him and it's that concept of look they full-on brought this concept and they invested in it like I can't, like Anthony Chilino full-on said in interviews where it's like I didn't expect to make my money back on this yeah, yeah. investment <laughs> because because be, because there's such a huge amount of money that went into this show and it's Coriolanus which is no Hamlet unfortunately when you're ranking the Shakespeare's and people are going to go see yeah. it. Yeah mm -hmm. yeah which is I think kind of interesting in terms of my, <laughs> in terms of yeah. my comments on like you know do you introduce people to Coriolanus with this production or mm -hmm. like it's interesting mm -hmm. that they did this with a show that is kind of like lesser known as far as yeah. Shakespeare's tragedies yeah. go. Mm -hmm. 
like if you did a Hamlet like this, people would be like, yeah, we know Hamlet, so we can kind of absorb mm -hmm. ourselves in what you're doing with Hamlet. But I yeah. think for a lot of the audience probably had never seen and read Coriolanus before. Mm -hmm. So this would have been an interesting introduction. This show yeah. for me though, Shakespearean wise, like hits a way, like the mo it's the most relevant show in today's day and age, I think mm -hmm. of all of his works, arguably. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the, the politics, there's so many different ways you can approach this text too, and, mm -hmm. and the politics of it alone. There's mm -hmm. so many nods and shades to, mm -hmm. to um, leaders we have today, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, even in, in one of the discussion panels, I think it was Robert, maybe Andre, of mm -hmm. saying, you know, po I think it was Robert Lepage saying, post-pandemic, there's going to be so many folks that don't want to abide to the new rules or think right. that they're more than or less yes. it, more than than others and he said like those are the real Coriolanuses and it's yeah. so yeah. so true mm -hmm. and i remember seeing this show post trump as well yeah. um and and just seeing like ramifications of that so it's it's definitely like mm -hmm. we're living in a political climate especially now mm -hmm. too post pandemic mm -hmm. even more so yeah. um and it's just it's it's beautiful to see it's only been 2 years but yet that mm -hmm. theme of of this production is still yeah. ringing quite true yes. and I don't think it's going away anytime soon either yes. so um I think for, for especially showing in 2018 like it, mm -hmm. it definitely it definitely was worth worth the budget yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely this mm -hmm. is definitely I think well worth the investment so bravo institutionally and we'll get to what he's working on next with Robert Lepage because they did allude to it in the interview so we will talk about that at the very end mm. um but Going forward, so we've already kind of talked about the themes uh, and motifs that, that we saw in the show, whether or not they kind of worked. I mean, some of the ones that uh, uh, Pasha has brought up that he was wanting to explore were like uh, being in historical places where history seems to repeat itself, which is where he kind of got the initial idea was the idea of being in Rome in a very modern hotel, modern area, but at the same time across the road you have the Colosseum. Or, or, a bath, or, or like the ruins of a bathhouse. Mm -hmm. And just how he brought that forward, and I think that did work. I think that with the bathhouse, for example, we, we find out of, of the idea where he talked a lot about the te Roman technologies that we've now adopted into our own lives, such as the thumbs up, thumbs down, how, how the mm -hmm. early version of, of like the Roman internet with like the wall where like you scroll a question on one side. Yeah, like a Facebook wall or whatever. Yeah. Exactly, or, or mm -hmm. in fact, you have like wax tablets See, that were very much like our tablets. It's interesting because like they talked a lot about that in that like supplementary material that they posted yeah. on YouTube. And mm -hmm. I had heard a lot about this production's use of social media prior mm -hmm. to seeing it. And I honestly feel like not enough was done with that considering mm -hmm. what a driving mm -hmm force in the inspiration it was like yeah. aside from the one texting scene between the two sentences yeah. Really like yeah very clear social media mm -hmm. influence and texting mm -hmm. is a private conversation that doesn't even involve social media the way we understand mm -hmm. it the wall the yeah. thumbs up so yeah like i i feel like more could have been done with that mm -hmm. and now yeah. hearing these interviews and what an what an important part of the inspiration it was i mm -hmm. feel like it was a real missed opportunity in my opinion mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they definitely could have gone further, but I think once again, it's going back to the text of where do you work in those moments of of exploring modern technology within the Roman setting? Like, I think the texting scene between the Sentinels worked; it felt very organic. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'd be more interested to see in that early design conceptual talks where where Robert and Anthony sat down together, where they may have gone. Yeah, where because I'm sure I'm sure Robert came up with a whole bunch of different ideas of where to go, and it's like, well, where's the budget? Where can we do it? Where yeah. does this work? Where does it not? I would love to have seen while they were driving, maybe mm -hmm. like some headlines scrolling by of like, of just what seeing the media turning against Coriolanus, or seeing some more of the, or seeing some more of actions between the two. What's her name, Stephen Olmet and Tom Rooney's uh, yeah. senators, as, as they're turning the tide against Coriolanus. I've like seen some media outputs of like headlines going by where it's like you see it's starting great with Coriolanus coming back, and he's got good headlines, and by the time you get to the banishment scene, you see more headlines going by. Or even instead of sort of using that, um, the, uh, the C-SPAN videos, it would yeah, be great to I, see like live tweeting of this scene where well, you see and that's exactly live tweeting this moment. What I'm thinking, like what, how I commented earlier, how a lot of these scenes of the public voice have been removed mm -hmm. from this play. Mm -hmm. Even right. if those were just like part of the projection design more presently, yeah. that is really what social media is for. It's kind of mm -hmm. the pulse on the zeitgeist. Yeah. That we don't really, see much of in this production that is ostensibly all about that from the ground up. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. That's why I, I always, like I said, I kept going back to thinking like, I have to think of this whole production as being post-apocalyptic because there was just mm -hmm. too many 
it's because there was not enough nod, in my opinion, to the social media aspect, you know, like the converse, the text conversation just kind of pops up, but then yeah. you have like the contrast of the settings and like the Roman bath. And then you mm -hmm. have, you know, the futuresque server outfits mm -hmm. you have, like it, it almost in a sense, if you think of it that way, it's like they were trying to not put us this, like this is present day per se. Mm -hmm. um, Cause even like the radio, the radio scene. That yeah, they mentioned the, yeah. They, or, they mentioned Trump in like the radio yeah, snippets. You they hear played, or, yeah. or the, the, yeah. the people, um, I know they were trying to sort of mark mm -hmm. on specific showcasing mm -hmm. of specific citizens, but mm -hmm. that whole scene too, like even yeah. the way that they were dressed or the way they carried yeah. themselves. I'm like, mm -hmm. are you a couple from like today? Or like, are you from the eighties? Are you from mm -hmm. the nineties? Like, mm -hmm. so um, I almost wonder if there was a more of a social media influence other things would have to change with the production as well. Oh yeah, I'm not against mm -hmm. that happening. I just mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. when you hear them talk about how this inspired them, I think it's a real shame yeah. that I can only really pinpoint one clear example in the production and even right. it's like a half measure that I enjoy, don't get me wrong, but yeah. mm -hmm. didn't seem to integrate it the way that they seem yeah. to think it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, the other theme that Robert Lepage brought up that I think did work was the how we communicate in the modern era it's where he brought up the idea of the one man alone in his uh, bedroom with a microphone is, is kind of able to this huge forum of people. And we see that very clearly in the opening scene with whether it's the, the statue talking to the whole audience yeah. and so that same thing of this lone person being able to speak to this forum or even the following scene with like the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the radio scene, the radio booth. Mm -hmm sequence yeah. i was like okay I, I see where you're going with this idea because it is very true i mean er, nowadays everybody has a podcast even alex jones has a podcast <laughs> i mean i mean i mean just look at trump's twitter are, feed are we in a podcast right now <laughs> we could be ryan we very well could be this could be it's like a truman a show thing are we all on a secret <laughs> podcast that no one knows about? I, I don't even know if this show the cup is technically a podcast or if it doesn't meet the standard it podcast. hasn't been turned into a podcast yet i have yet to turn these videos into a podcast we could i'll talk to will we'll see if maybe we'll turn these into a, a podcast option as well why as not a, you wouldn't want to hear my option. voice. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Very true. But I do think that was one area that Lepage did hit his mark was that theme of one man being able to hit, I, hit a large amount with just either even the phone call with the Janice and um what's his name? The two senators again, where they're on the phone yeah. whipping up the support. Yeah, Brutus, against, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes yeah, exactly. We see I, them on the phone. Are, those are the characters that if they wanted to go for more of like uh, the podcaster or the YouTube star has mm -hmm. like the big influence, like we could have seen more scenes of them yes. actually taking advantage of that new media. I thought the phones yeah. was very well done and definitely mm -hmm. staged this idea of what was rallying the people. Mm -hmm. what, was, this yeah. what was but interesting yeah. about that too, sorry, just like touching yeah, on that, um, they were using corded phones and I couldn't yeah. help but notice too, Meninius had a chunkier laptop, yet yeah. you have these guards that are clearly smartphoning, texting each other. And yeah. we know that it is yeah. because there's the mm -hmm. white and blue yeah. stereotypical Apple iMessage yes. conversation. So yeah. again, it's like, is this a generational thing? You know, is I it like the older- I think that it could have been, I think that it could have been him playing with the idea of yeah of generations mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the ones that we see who are magistrates are older mm -hmm. and that they have a very archaic way of thinking right. so i think maybe that would be the i mean that's just the justification justification yeah, yeah, yeah. That, mm -hmm. but yeah. i don't i'm not sure there, there wasn't yeah. enough of a split difference well it's an interesting so, idea because i don't see the conflict of this play being a generational one king lear yeah. on the other hand yeah no mm -hmm. young mm -hmm. versus the old but yeah like, as far as I can tell, Coriolanus is, is supposed to be of the same generation as Brutus right. and say, yes. so like, yeah. It's it would be interesting though to unpack it from a generational read because you could mm -hmm. easily loop in young Martius too in that. Yeah. Like, well, you could push that. that theme definitely. But or young Martius can... doesn't really have much of a role in this play. He like represents the future, but mm -hmm. he does, there's no conflict between him or in which yes. he is like a, a pawn. Right, I would but say. If, if you had him like mm -hmm. not playing with 
circa 1990s G.I. Joes and right. playing with something more modern than like, like a right. sketch <laughs> that would play. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah I just know. saw Marcia says when he was playing with those toys as more of a reflection of his father and the yeah. fact that he is a child playing war mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. guess his 100%. father is also a child. I mean, he throws enough tantrums to, <laughs> to justify it. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think I think that's one other kind of particular mm -hmm. uh, theme that I think they may have explored is just you know bickering like children mm -hmm. uh, amongst one another. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So next we get into our specialized questions of uh, uh, of the episode. Are you saying those questions weren't special? <laughs> <laughs> those questions. Right. Those, those were questions for the commoners. Very now we're special. We're in the Senate. Now we're, we're in the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now we're, we're now we're diving a little bit deeper into this. So one of the things we do have to address is the director uh, Robert Lepage, whose work is now being re-examined in, in a new light mm -hmm. after some missteps he's had in his in some other recent productions he's done. Uh, so the question is, uh, how do we interpret or watch this particular play since it came out before a lot of the um, re-examination began for his work? And how do exactly do we look at it now under this new kind of light that we've been looking at Robert Lepage under? Ryan, you kind of came up with this question, so I will let you lead with your response to this. Yeah, so I have very mixed feelings on this matter uh -huh. because as I think I may have mentioned a couple times just in this uh -huh. episode I, I've always been a big fan of Lepage's work and uh -huh. I've been following him for a long time I uh -huh. may even write a chapter of my dissertation about him to be uh -huh. but, uh, but yes but I am also conflicted based on the fact uh -huh. that I think on the matters of those two infamous productions Slav and uh -huh. Kanata I think he was fundamentally wrong yeah. about like how he handled it uh the <laughs> farce of himself that he maybe mm -hmm. temporarily however made on social media yeah. which if, if this production would came out after these events then i would have certainly thought that the social media infusion here had a lot to do with mm -hmm. you know his own objections against the people seeing himself yeah. as a bit of a Coriolanus type but all yeah. of the news about these things were breaking immediately while this production was actually happening. Right. So like in the summer of 2018, so clearly mm -hmm. this was all planned in advance, but uh, yeah. like hearing the way he talks about it much more recently in these interviews that have been posted on the Stratford YouTube channel, mm -hmm. like this is clearly on his mind, the, his own relation to the people and social yes. media being the platform where mm -hmm. all of that was unpacked. Um, yeah. And yeah, and social media certainly had an impact on his somewhat probably temporary, but his fall from social grace happening on a public yes. platform for mm -hmm. the commoners to chime into. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason why I say I think he was fundamentally wrong about it is like he certainly in the, and uh, if you're watching Robert Lepage, I, <laughs> my, my, <laughs> he's gonna write your he's gonna write his dissertation about you yeah Don't like worry. like a big yeah. fan um but yes <laughs> um but yes i think the issue was that he kept defending his actions and saying mm -hmm. that like you know i've consulted a certain like people from these communities who you know i've done my research i know what i'm doing i'm being so reverential that i'm making these art as an ally and support of these communities but when mm -hmm. these communities mm -hmm. so people who are telling you you shouldn't be doing this mm -hmm. i think you know you're not <laughs> being a very good ally and mm -hmm. maybe you know I, i've read certain reports of people who were in the meetings that he had like in advance of the research he did and many of mm -hmm. them did advise him and his collaborators that you know they should have more black and indigenous uh, performers and creative mm -hmm. contributors respectively which was not done in either production and right. um also speaking of uh this kind of autobiographical undercurrent which Lepo is nothing if not an autobiographer in so many mm -hmm. of his productions mm -hmm. uh when Kanata finally did see the stage after all the uproar at the mm -hmm. Théâtre de Soleil um there was a scene in it of one of the, the protagonistic characters being told that she couldn't do her artwork about uh, the indigenous uh, uh, missing and murdered women because mm -hmm. she didn't have the support of the parents. So like, oh, ha, 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 we see what you're doing there. <laughs> <laughs> so 
yeah, I don't know if this answers your question. I just think it uh, a, a little. It, it, it definitely leads into it. I mean, I I mean, I can kind of go forward because I there because after reading the articles, particularly about with slave, um, with that, that particular play and the idea of race, that did make me relook at this mm -hmm. play as well because it, it's a very clear choice of making. Coriolanus, uh, portrayed by Andre Stiles as a well, black actor. Well, it's right. funny that you, Mac, if you don't mind me by saying, so yeah, one, no. of, one of the defenses I read mm -hmm. uh, by Michelle Vays, it was mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah, I think it was in Theater Journal or Performing Arts yeah. Journal. Uh, yeah, one of the defenses I read was just like, by the way, when all this was going on, Lepage was directing Coriolanus with a black actor in the title <laughs> role. And I'm just like, that kind of sounds like the I can't be racist because I have a black friend argument. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and I'm not yeah. saying Lepage is racist. I think, yes, there was some, you know, racial mishaps, certainly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that makes him a racist per se, no. but like, I yeah. don't think that's a valid argument and defense <laughs> um, yeah because i mean like when, when, when especially with the way Coriolanus is portrayed as a very angry black man on on stage where he's flipping tables and yelling pretty much the entire play as ed pointed out where you have this and then also you have the most quiet character as you said ed the most under or uh, ryan as the most underrated character which is um his wife virgilia mm -hmm. so you have two of them and then they're child is white which yeah that's just See, that's why I, I i loved that if i'm going to interject because yeah, the no, idea go, go, go. of race did not cross my mind at all for this play well, and i actually yeah, sorry joel you finished found <laughs> that um and again this is maybe just my opinion and i could be completely off the mark in regards to who other what other people think but um i've also seen a lot of the people of color in this production in other shows too. So maybe yeah. that, that was another yeah. reason why I wasn't yeah. really seeing them as their race. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just, it, it being such a political piece, it was refreshing mm -hmm. to not have race be the, the first thing that my mind goes to personally. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. that wasn't what it was supposed to be about. And I, mm -hmm. I do think that produ this production did a really good job of, of that. Mm -hmm. See, I will say there were two key moments for me when race did kind of present itself to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And one of them, like, is just very simple, very subtle, but I couldn't help noticing it, mm -hmm. was that, uh, yeah, it was an act one scene, a nine, I believe, uh, when he says he had the blood on his face in the locker room there, and he says, right. I, they all just declared him Coriolanus, his new name. And mm -hmm. he says, I will go wash, and when my face is paused, fair, you shall perceive whether I blush or no. And mm. so that slight pause, and I don't know if this was Robert's idea or if it was Andre's idea, but the slight pause before the word fair, mm -hmm. you know, implying because, you know, as a black actor, is mm. not fair <laughs> in, the, in the sense of the entry is a very just person. Yeah. He's a great person. Yeah. I love Andre. Andre, yeah, if you're course. watching, oh, he's, I'm like a lovely. giant fan. <laughs> he's but, lovely. But, he's wonderful. But yeah, it's that pause, I think, was a very deliberate nod at the, at the you know, the way that these lines were very clearly written for a white yeah. person. Mm -hmm. The other moment that I think was very important that listening to the interviews very clearly was not on at least Antony and uh, Robert's radars, but uh, the, you know, the line, oh boy, or boy, oh slave, like in Act 5. Yeah. Six. Right. And, like they, the way they talk about him, this is the traditional reading of the text, that this is mm -hmm. an infantilized character with mm -hmm. his relationship with his mother, the way he has his right. temper tantrums. Mm -hmm. But that language carries a lot of racial baggage. So I think mm -hmm. we can't when the casting is done in this way, I think we mm -hmm. can't just say, oh, he's called a boy, like a child, because he's in bed. Oh, is so, it's so interesting so you say that, though, because as someone who I've seen Andre Sills in, in Octoroon and in mm -hmm. Master Hale and the Boys, where, quite frankly, race are, like, prominent themes in both of those pieces, um, like, the, the moments you're mentioning, like, they totally went over my head. Like, I did not even think of 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 that like and obviously like you're saying paying homage to that with mm -hmm. a, an actor of color 100 percent. but mm -hmm. i just personally find find it you're mentioning these moments and and i did not even mm -hmm. think to to place right ed, ha it, yeah ed let, let's have you wait since you've been very <laughs> quiet throughout this whole discussion where, where, where do you stand on, on uh, this 
I'm not I'm not quiet because of anything brewing. Um, <laughs> I I mean I I I, I watched the production. I, I I saw the um the blind casting and I mean there was also projections of like civil rights movements in there. Yes. Uh, so I, I I mean it kind of the civil rights like that sort of stuff. I mean I I get mm -hmm. how it mixes in. Uh, but yeah, going to like mm -hmm. Ryan's point where there were like clear moments like when he was saying "boy" and and I was, I was oh because oh, that is kind of like a that does carry a lot of weight with it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm I'm not uh, I'm not personally. I, I mean I I don't I don't represent every black actor out there. Uh, I can only speak for myself <laughs> so when Nobody I say this. <laughs> yeah, I, I can always uh, when I say this I say this for myself. But I'm not somebody particularly interested with like uh like with like political I guess uh, like politics within theater it's mm -hmm. not really my forte I, I have a lot to say when it just comes mm -hmm. to like the artistic and like symbolic uh elements of a show but mm -hmm. like the political ones just kind of I'm, I'm just not really mm -hmm. with it but i mean if i if i like am to speak on it then it, it kind of came off as a sort of an apology if i if i mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like i mean i know that the, because this play came before slav and uh in uh, Canada, yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh but like you said, it's like they, they were planning they were planning the works uh I'm sure months in advance. Uh so it's like I, I mean, I don't know, I just it, there is like this sort of uh I guess kind of playing into especially mm -hmm. with those two plays coming out right afterwards. Mm -hmm. That's just kinda I don't know, maybe it's a coincidence, mm -hmm. maybe it's not. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that that's yeah. really all I have to yeah. say on it. I mean like uh, overall, I mean I, I yeah, I, I think it's just nowadays, I, I mean, uh, we now kind of have to go back and look, re-evaluate re, re, re things. I, I think that's where this question kind of came from. And this is where you were kind of originally going when you pitched this question to me for the yeah. panel, which was the idea of, in, in the new light, because there's a lot of times where art gets reevaluated down the road where it's like, oh, maybe we, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Well, yeah. yeah no, it's, like, it's very interesting there. I, I think based on the specific nature of the, these controversies. Mm -hmm. And like, let's keep in mind that these are not the first controversies that LaPage has had, especially mm -hmm. to do with race and casting. Like, mm -hmm. uh, certainly there was some early productions of his that did use actual blackface. It was like his production of the, of the Beggar's Opera, the Busker's Opera did have actual oh. blackface on stage. Like it was a different time, but a little uncomfortable <laughs> to your reasons. And, and also, <laughs> Uh, in Needles and Opium, certainly, like, before it was a three-hander and was a one-man show, so he played the role of Miles Davis himself in, like, a somewhat tasteful shadow mm -hmm. sequence, uh, but mm -hmm. then they actually, you know, re-performed it later on with an actor of color in the role, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly, like, his Dragons trilogy as an update, mm -hmm. or Blue Dragon, I don't remember which one was first and second, you know, integrating more collaboration from mm -hmm. Asian Canadian actors. Uh, and yeah, so I'd like to think that there is, you know, LaPage and Ex Machina in general has always framed themselves as this company that is devoted to the work in progress. Nothing is ever finished. Things can mm -hmm. get revised and revamped. Yeah. So I think, I think there is certainly hope for Slev and Canada to actually, you know, have these like better future productions mm -hmm. that do have more creative input from mm -hmm. the communities in question mm -hmm. that feature more performers yeah. of those uh, backgrounds. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, 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 in terms of the question of just how we reevaluate, like his career is going to be fine. He's doing okay. He has a lot coming on <laughs> the horizon. Lot. Yes, he like, does. Like, People are still it, wanting to work with him. It would be very different if we were talking about like an Albert Schultz production, for example, who, right. oh, and another Canadian theater celebrity who for different reasons has fallen from public grace and mm -hmm. probably bounce back because of it mm -hmm. if you're watching albert schultz i'm sorry just like him but you know <laughs> um. truth <laughs> yeah fantastic okay uh well we kind of answered the next question of is this show on brand with herbert lapage i think we all agreed that with what we've seen the technology aspect is very yeah lapage like you see the clips of his um eight um eight eight seven uh show that he did where you see where it's the house and the apartments and you see the projections inside and just the way it kind of spins mm -hmm. and intercuts with the different sets, you can clearly see the technology. And as Ryan pointed out, if you're gonna do a technology heavy 
Coriolanus or any type of really technology heavy show, Lepage is kind of your go-to guy to do this right. And I think, mm. and I, think I have to, I, I do think this kind of is a very on brand for him to do this really kind of in-depth cinematic reinterpretation I, of the work. I definitely think he, he will probably be a post, this, this is an alliteration for you, a post-pandemic mm -hmm. pioneer in the oh. world, 100%. There you go, Jill. Coined that term now. <laughs> a wordsmith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Ryan, you seem most familiar with Lepage's work. Do you think this was this was mainly on brand with his uh, previous works? Yeah, certainly on brand. I would mm -hmm. say. I mm -hmm. kind of feel like we've addressed this already, but yeah, yeah. certain. There were definitely the moments, the camera work. One, yeah. the car was another. The, yeah. the yeah. texting certainly, like mm -hmm. yeah. That's mm -hmm. that's why you hire someone like him to Perfect. do it. Awesome. Shakespeare production. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Well, speaking of Shakespeare, let's dive in. Let's, we have the last few questions of the show, and they deal more on the text side of things. Mm -hmm. So the first question we have is, if Coriolanus had become consul, do we think he would have done well in the position? Ed, I'm going to mm. let you lead first. So I really see this character as the contrast to Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. I, you know, they both come into Rome, a hero, uh, a war hero, and mm -hmm. one <laughs> finds more success than the other. Mm -hmm. But I mean, he, he wasn't given a chance to, to really be a consul, mm -hmm. to really implement any law or order. But, but if uh, he had become a consul, do you think do you think he would have done well in the job? Well, that's what I'm. That's what I'm. That's what I'm. That's why I bring up Julius Caesar because it's like mm -hmm. it's hard to say, right? It's it's Julius Caesar did well, and he had a air of arrogance about him mm -hmm. too and pride. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it comes down to actual action, Coriolanus is somebody who gets it done. Maybe the means is you know, the, do the means justify the ends? Mm -hmm. The ends justify the means. Mm -hmm. Maybe the means are are a bit radical but I mean at that time I think in the in the beginning of the play they said that they were facing a, a, a disease right a, a, a plague a of their plague. own yeah. yeah a famine yeah so a famine um yeah and I mean that wasn't very like uh, like in the I guess patricians uh realm that wasn't mm -hmm. too heavily like like addressed upon it was like mm -hmm. I think I I guess just to nip it in the butt I think Coriolanus would have done some good in that mm -hmm. time uh mm -hmm. at it with those circumstances i i do think he he would have um mm -hmm. because he is somebody that truly loved rome and fought for like his country uh mm -hmm. but yeah i have such a jill's making a face i want to let her go first i'm gesturing up a storm over here um, <laughs> <laughs> the tempest so is that's my, that's um, my, i want to believe i want to believe in coriolanus <laughs> i do believe too uh, um i i do too unfortunately and in a way i kind of feel bad for him in a sense that i don't think like we've i've already mentioned this before um the whole idea of, of a warrior being a politician, you know, mm -hmm. of a reality TV show person being a politician. That you know, was it's like, I'm, I'm not gonna have a plumber do my brain surgery and I'm yeah. not gonna have a surgeon, you know, do expert work on my toilet. Like, <laughs> yeah. to me, <laughs> there's certain um, circumstances and social um, hierarchy in a way that, yeah. that I feel needs to be um, address and abide it to but the problem with him mm. though is I feel kind of bad in a sense because I feel like he could have had potential as a human but just mm -hmm. the dialogue that he's only ever known from mm -hmm. a very young age um is is militaristic and warrior-esque and dealing mm -hmm. through the physical and just going back to all these Converse interviews that they're having and the idea of the warrior mm -hmm. being you can't bring you can't transpose civility over top of military mm -hmm. right and, yeah. and it's you know, in a, in a utopic world, yes, hopefully you could do that, or there would be mm -hmm. sort of a blend of that. But so in a way, I feel bad, because I do think mm -hmm. he does have strong qualities that would make him um, mm -hmm. um, a very aggressive, but um, res like respectful voice for mm -hmm. the whole. I just don't think he's ever been given the vocabulary or the means to do that. And you see mm -hmm. that even like his mother, the person who raised him, right, or essentially, mm -hmm. well, I guess too, she actually says like, 
sucked from teeth. So quite literally, like Mm -hmm. she was an an evident part of his life, um, Mm -hmm. but has always kind of talked over him or talked Mm -hmm. down to him and and never really measured up to Mm -hmm. verbally uh, being, you know, like the the perfect boy for her. So it's Mm -hmm. like, he, he wasn't even given the vocab Mm -hmm. to do that. So, Mm -hmm. um, it's just like wrong place, wrong time, I think, yeah. for him as well. Um, mm-hmm. Similar to, we had this conversation with Lear. It's like, mm-hmm. he, this person doesn't belong in the time frame that is, mm-hmm. is being offered to him mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. So I guess in a nutshell, I don't, I, I'm gonna have to disagree-ish with Ed, just saying like, I don't mm-hmm. think he has the means to be, yeah. be like mm-hmm. a, an over bit, like yeah. an all encompassing console. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ryan? Well, I think I I also disagree, Ed. Sorry, but like I think, I also disagree, Ed. But I knew it. I think the reason for me though comes actually down to something you said, and that you said that he loves Rome and he fought for Rome and did also. And my question is, does he love Rome? Because the, <laughs> yeah, I, I the second that, that address, so. well, and I guess the question that I bring up is, what does it mean to love? like a nation state, this mm-hmm. kind of like non-existent, mm-hmm. this imagined community to use mm-hmm. Benedict Anderson's mm-hmm. Indian, but like, mm-hmm. does that mean loving its people? Does it mean loving the concept of the nation? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. when the second that the people turn on him, he is very quick to join the Vulcans and yeah. yes. fight against them. So yeah. I, I have a hard time thinking that I think what he loved was the place war. he had in it, the war that like mm-hmm. he, yeah. Getting back to what you said, Jill, that this mm-hmm. militaristic attitude that his love for Rome was the love of incurring wounds yeah. mm-hmm. in, in defense yes. of Rome and showing 27 off- wounds. 27 wounds. I'm just saying the yes. His dictionary is only mm-hmm. actions, I feel. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, he, he doesn't mm-hmm. have yeah. the wherewithal to use words, right? Yes. It's always like, mm-hmm. if I can't physically be here, I have to be there because that's the yeah. only means mm-hmm. I know how to operate. Yes. So being a console, being a, a voice for the mm-hmm. people, like, it shall not be so. Yeah, and I don't even think it's necessarily because he would be bad at politics, although you could argue that he certainly would also be, but I think it's just the lack yeah. of love for mm-hmm. Rome mm-hmm. itself, as opposed yeah. to the idea of Rome mm-hmm. and the idea that he's fighting for, yep. doesn't mm-hmm. match up with, as soon as he's come face to face with actual Romans, his opinion yes. of Rome changes yeah. very quickly. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, when, will... <laughs> when <Yeah>. in Rome. <laughs> yes. Ha ha! <laughs> <laughs> Guys, this episode is so punny. I love it so I love much. It. I will also say I do not think he he would make a good console just because I wrote in my I I really took down what Andre Styles said about him where, where 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 they say it's great that while he is honest and unable to lie, he is a military man who is not empathetic. He does he does suffer from pride and is and personally does not like leadership. And so he also lives in the world of absolutes where he is, where as the military, it's like, you will go in, you will kill the, this group of people. You will go conquer this area, go take that hill. And in politics, it's all a world of gray where sometimes your friend is your friend and sometimes your friend is a backstabbing snake who will, yeah. will vote against your thing. And he doesn't deal in that world. He can't mm-hmm. mentally compute that type of world where he doesn't full, where that, and that, that's why, um, what what are their names again, Ryan? The two the two senators, Brutus uh, and Sicinius. Brutus and Sicinius. Mm. The two of them. That, like that's why they outwit him in the Senate. It's because they understand that game field, and he doesn't. Which is why the whole idea of the campaigning that scene where he's like, "Why do I have to campaign? I already like got the wounds. I I've already done yeah. the job. Give me the title. Let's go." <laughs> well, and you bring it, up something very. You bring up yeah. something very interesting, Mac, because okay, he's not part of that world but is mm-hmm. that the sort of people the backstabbing yeah, i was the ones? just thinking that <laughs> yeah <laughs> is that the kind of people we want i like is that it, is the world of politics somebody though, that, no matter what it's you the yeah, world but, I mean, is that politics but is that desirable in a leader yeah. it's like knowing the system the sneaky back alley deals and you that. have to yeah. as yeah, a good leader you, you have to know your battlefield it's the whole thing of why is he a good military leader is because he can think like the vulcans and, and beat them same thing when he switched over to the vulcan side why is he so good at his job? Is because he understands that playbook. Politics <laughs> to get to get anything done in politics, you have to understand that world and that playbook. Well, like this I, is why we don't. I, I, 
I know, like, I, I have seen the film Lincoln, so I know what you're getting at, and, like, even good leaders have to do it, but at the same time, like, those two characters, like, reek of, like, Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell to me, and, like... They are! That's <laughs> like, exactly that's, who they are, and that's their game they yeah. play, and, and they it's, control but, that world. That's their playbook. But, I mean, Unless, this plays into a... And I guess this really goes into the relevancy of thing. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, well, that's... Is that something we shouldn't let let change, or even dare to try and change with drain the this. swamp <laughs> oh god well, I, mean, you, I, mean, I mean you've seen people try to say they're going to change the, the playbook but unfortunately the way politics is built these days with with lobbying and big and, and big deals behind closed doors no matter where you go especially in the western world in democracy say, that's just the way democracy is, i mean you go watch but, a show like john adams which yeah. is all about the creation of, of, of the Declaration of Independence. Great show of Paul Giamatti from 2007. But that whole, but the whole, ba- say, the whole Mac, backroom dealing of what goes on into making that Mac, constitutional let's say, yeah. let's say he did, you know, become consul and he, did, and he was able to get rid of all that. Would that not be something favorable? Since that's not well, how he could he get operates? rid of it, he, that'd, be great, that'd, be, that'd be great if he could. But even Meninius, yeah. he deals with that still, world. But there's still, there's still, even... Even though, Brutus the and well Sicinius, the even though Brutus and Sicinius <laughs> are snake-ish, like, there's a mundane, like, they, they y- if you're a political people. leader, yeah. you need to have an equilibrium between things, you know? Like, you need to have that, that, that gumption, that angst, but you also yeah. need to be common, common enough that you're, you're, you're glazing over all, all realms, all walks mm-hmm. of life, right? Mm-hmm. So as a person, you might not be the most bold. You might not be the most characteristic or, or the mm-hmm. picture perfect portrait of it. Wow, my mm-hmm. alliterations and plosives are on point. Uh, <laughs> um, but some someone like mm-hmm. Coriolanus, because and even Andre Sills in his particular interpretation, he mm-hmm. said in his interview, he's like, he's sort of like the antihero in the sense that he mm-hmm. stands by his beliefs no matter what. Yeah. And that is not what a leader is. Like a, mm-hmm. you need to sort of encompass all walks of life, regardless of how you behind closed doors mm-hmm. exude the your own persona. Yeah. That unfortunately, yes, there's sometimes un, like people who personally don't fit the quota, but publicly mm-hmm. do glaze enough wherewithal to sort of be be like a a, like a knowledgeable voice Mm -hmm. of the masses like whereas i don't think coriolanus had like just by sheer fact of not having any verbal etiquette any Mm -hmm. verbal foundation any verbal beliefs you know like he doesn't have that in his in his person so i guess Mm -hmm. from from a from a like philosophical point of view, yes, Ed, like someone like Coriolanus coming in and infiltrating mm-hmm. and switching things up and you know, having that that would be interesting, that would be, you know, like intriguing to sort of have like d- to to digest. But this mm-hmm. character alone, I think there's too many red flags. Mm-hmm. I think it's also important to note that when he got into office, they they were working they were what is it, poking at him. Mm-hmm. They, oh, yeah. they were working sure. the, they were working well, against him. I mean that's, so that's like, exactly what they were doing from, from the get-go they were already needling him yeah. to try and make him act out which which played into their narrative it's funny you said needling because brought. you think of you know Coriolanus has his whole like saber his whole the saber, saber his office yeah. whereas they have the darts you know what I mean yeah. like it's mm-hmm. little it's little big it's squeamish it's bold it's yeah. you know yeah. there's there's yeah. The darts have precision. The sword has volume. Yeah, yeah. and the sword's also curved too. So it's like any yeah. any cut, any is going to be mm-hmm. very like different. Whereas oh, you know, I yeah. really like that sword imagery with the two offices and the mm-hmm. sword mantle, and then that was parallel to the paper board, the board of papers. Yeah, you know who well, I think is a... the picture perfect politician in all of this is Menenius. Because he can he speak, is. he can speak both languages, and he knows yes. that he can. Yeah. He he's the picture perfect like. You have the, just just the dash of arrogance, but the, mm-hmm. the actual knowledge to back mm-hmm. up your points and your opinions yeah. to the point where even, you know, when there's that huge ruckus happening where um, Coriolanus was going to go off on Brutus and Sicinius and they were mm-hmm. running back and forth quite literally behind the mm-hmm. hallway. And then at the end yes. of that scene, but then he's just like freaking takes the saber and just like tosses it on the wall. Like it's like you just yeah. held a weapon of war and you just were like, yeah. Meh, it's fine. I'm like, yeah. you know what you're doing. Like you can physically and verbally slay mm-hmm. 
anybody. So it's yeah, funny. Because, for console, everyone. Let's do it. Oh I my agree. God, hundred percent. Even so, that's what made that the scene where he wants to to break down the gate. Um, and you know, you have these sort of buffoon guards telling me can't pass. And yeah. literally Tom McCamus alone is kind of just like, it's funny. It was kind of like a look into him too. He's like, do you know who I am? Like I've yeah. been on this stage way more longer than you ever. Like, you know, there was just like knowing yeah. him, but like yes. that alone was such a cool thing. Cause he, if it wasn't for a, a, like quite literally a bullets being pumped into his body, because mm -hmm. he's like, well, clearly these people only know how to shoot. They're not going to yeah. sit and have like a, a civilized conversation. Mm -hmm. He could have walked right in 100%. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, but then he, again, there was that he knows he's, he's like an aura, an aura seeker, I feel yeah. in a way, because he, he knows how he needs to conduct himself mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. everyone he's in relationship with. Mm -hmm. Um, he's so, you know, like he, he knows to just be calm, cool, and collected and a grounding yeah. force in the living room scene. Cause he's like, the Lumnia is going to go off. Coriolanus is going to act like a child. They're going to end up yelling at each other. So I'm just here to sort of be the mediator. It's like, yes, you know yeah. your role. And to me, yeah. that, that is, a, is like a picture perfect console or politician mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. You need to know your enemies and you need to know your allies. Mm -hmm. um, but you also need to know like, how to conduct yourself with them mm. as well like yes. uh, yeah well Minnie said is joe Manini is for console that's the takeaway so yes very good okay <laughs> last question Woohoo! we're here uh so the last question is uh we kind of talked about this a little bit but i think you need to have a little bit deeper is what elements do we think were highlighted by the modern setting and what elements do we think were lost by the modern setting of, of the show Ryan, I'll let you lead on this one. Mm, I might need a minute to think this one over, so come back to me. Oh boy. Can you, okay. can you read it again, Mac? Again, to yeah. just... Sure. Uh, what elements uh, uh, do we think were, hi were highlighted with this modern production, and what elements do we think were lost? So, the setting of being modernized, mm -hmm. what do we think was highlighted by this setting? What do we think maybe was lost? I mean, Ryan, you pointed out start. So, I think, Ryan, you pointed out the whole idea of taking away all those intercutting scenes with the public because mm -hmm. you can do that now with technology mm -hmm. um but at the same time the modernization highlighted the modernization of our own political atmosphere with the senate and the consul and the idea of campaigning door to door and the whole mm -hmm. idea of the military and the people trying and somebody who's not supposed to be a politician trying to be a politician mm -hmm. we get that like, there's a lot of great modern things you can do but at the same time i do think ryan you're right in the editing of the process the loss of the the, vo the the larger voice of the public that's in that play, mm -hmm. not in this play that isn't there on that Lepage. See, it's funny you say that because while I do certainly think that was a great loss in this production, and I understand just to streamline things, a lot of yeah. it was cut, some of it was kept, but yeah. I think in my mind that almost doesn't feel related to the modernization to me. I mm -hmm. think those same cuts could be made even in like an old sword and sandal toga version right. of this production as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm struggling to think of, I, I think in terms of just what the modernization added, and we've already mm -hmm. sort of discussed this, whether we needed to add this, but it does create a sense of the timelessness, so to speak, right. or this atemporal mm -hmm. feel of yeah. this could be now, it could be then, it could be the 40s, it could be the future, like mm -hmm. any, mm -hmm. like, issues like this can always happen, have always happened, maybe right. always will happen. Mm -hmm. And so by unmooring it from its, certainly from its early modern origins, let alone as a Roman setting, right? I think it does hammer that idea home. I don't know if anything is particularly lost due to modernization, maybe mm -hmm. just the intricacies of Roman politics, but because Shakespeare was writing it to comment on his own Elizabethan or Jacobian, maybe by this point, yes. uh, politics. Anyway, I don't know if it's essential to keep that mm -hmm. setting the way it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, I like period things in general, so <laughs> I, I never complain to see fancy yeah. dress, <laughs> you right. know, mm -hmm. um, but not essential yeah. for telling the story. Mm -hmm. Ed, how about you? Um, I think this is just a, a general sort of problem and I think that the play because it was set in a modern setting just kind of let that be a let that be okay uh what, mm -hmm. what I personally think is when it comes to approaching the text with Shakespeare is that mm -hmm. I find that a lot of a lot of Shakespeare plays that people are just 
looking to, or actors are just looking to find out what is this saying, right? Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to what image is this painting? Because at mm -hmm. the end of the day, Shakespeare is still poetry. Mm -hmm. um, right. So I just think the modern setting, if anything, if it loses anything, if anything is lost from this play is that it's just the, the poetic elements within the speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I am going to agree with Ed in that sense. Like they, there, there's um, like it was it was such a wonderful spectacle to watch and I was never lost in, in the the drive of the plot. But mm -hmm. when it came to the the introspective relationships and and like the communication between like, stripping down like all the spectacle and just the text itself right. and what beauty can come of that and having mm -hmm. that bleed into the physicality of the piece. Um, I will uh, pay props to, um, I believe, hold on, his last name is escaping me, Graham Abbey, who played mm -hmm. Ophidius. I think he did a wonderful job mm. of multiple things. One, playing the role that Lepage production has him play mm -hmm. via that B, um, the role that this Ophidius is and also the role mm -hmm. in this sort of multimedia production. Mm -hmm. um, two, he, he continued, like he has the traditional re relationship or, or susses out the, the beauty and the poetry that Ed was talking to. Mm -hmm. And C, it, it's like he, he knew this production was filmic and mm -hmm. it was almost like he knew that it would be one of the ones that would be blown up into proportion of like, this is a filmed version mm -hmm. of a Shakespeare thing that's gonna be on YouTube because mm -hmm. it was, he ha he encompassed all that mm -hmm. when when mm -hmm. the camera, the lens that we are meant to see with this YouTube mm -hmm. depiction, um, he was on stage, but doing a very brilliant filmic job of, mm -hmm. of acting it as well, mm -hmm. which I was like, you are killing it because theater and, and film are completely different mediums. Um, yes. And as an actor, it's, it's very, it can be very challenging to differentiate mm -hmm. the two. And he yeah. did it at the exact same time, <laughs> um, which I was like, wow, this is, this is stunning work. Um, so in a way I wanted more of that. I wanted there to be, mm -hmm. even though it was like in this cinematic background, I still mm -hmm. wanted the relationship of the t that the text has mm -hmm. to offer to mm -hmm. to be. Um, I've been saying digested a lot more a lot this this episode, <laughs> but it does make sense. The body of politics we are talking about digesting and and like viscerally um, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I wanted I wanted to see to see more more relationship to the text. Yeah. Um, okay. That was lost through, through okay. the multimedia setting. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Ryan, any final thoughts before we wrap up? I guess kind of just piggybacking off the conversation we were just having about like modernization. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very interesting that the promotional photography for this play keeps it in his Roman armor. And yes. it, yeah. yeah. That yeah that is, costume that is appears in nowhere in the production. It like, does not. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what to make of that. I, well, I'll be like, guessing. Well, I, I think that ties in? back to, because Stratford will do these photo shoots, particularly mm -hmm. for their seasonal programs. They do them way in the spring when they're still finishing up the current season. Mm -hmm. So it's before really any design or major uh, like direct choices have been made. So if you look at a lot of the pictures they take, uh, which I love. I mean, I love getting my Stratford season program with all the different pictures, yeah. mm -hmm. all the different seasons. But if you go look at them overall in general, they're very generical of what that show is, where it's like, oh, Coriolanus. Okay, this is what, right. this is kind of the, this is the basic poster picture we're going to get for now because we, because the director just hasn't had a chance to work. It's basically like announce the show and the director, cast the, the lead people so we can at least get them in some type of costume in front of a screen to do a picture for our programs. Right, we have some armor and storage, put this on. Like. Bingo, that's exactly, because yeah, like I, I remember, I, I, see, I always remember that the, 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 see, the, the upcoming season playbill always comes out end of August, start of September. Mm -hmm. it, and, yet, and yet they already have the, see, the next season bookmarks, which just the announcement of this is the theater, these are the shows, in the gift shop for free during the season that starts in like, June, I think, is when they start. That is when those bookmarks start coming out. 
yeah, so people like, can take those with them to hold on to. So like there's like, a yeah. pre-promotional train that they're chugging toward. Where I think that's why they had Corlinus in his armor was because it was like yeah. we don't know what his costume will be yet. Well, like I guess it could be modern, it could not be modern, but if it's, it's modern, not a huge deal, I just thought yeah. because that costume does appear nowhere in it and they go completely the opposite direction. I'm just <laughs> always fascinated by the relationship between pec like text and paratext in this yeah. regard, yeah, yeah. promotional Absolutely. material versus the production mm -hmm. itself. In a way, though, I think it's brilliant because, again, like when you watch the production with it being there's being so many different levels, you never have any idea like what's going to happen, what's mm -hmm. And then, like we've talked about countless times, uh, you don't know technically where in chronological time or place of mind mm -hmm, these scenes yeah. are happening in. Yeah. So it's almost it's almost kind of like witty in a sense of come see this like Roman warrior play, yeah. and then mm -hmm. he's like driving in a car with a do rag, you know, <laughs> where it's like <laughs> kind of spins play. it on its head a bit, you know. Yeah. It's almost like. Mm -hmm this is, we're not going to tell you what this is about at all. Like, like you're, yeah. you're going to see Durag should have you know? been the picture that they used, though. I don't <laughs> think so at all, because I think that would be chintzy. I, I don't think it, I think <laughs> it would I would have loved to have seen them use, like, the bloody look that he has in the shower scene. I would have loved but to see that. I feel like, though, that's, like, every Mackers poster. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, Including it's such a stereotypical yeah, Shakespeare of, like, look yeah. at this titular character with blood on his face you know yeah. like but if what you've happened? seen the thumbnail for the one we're gonna watch next week it pretty much looks like that that's yeah. what i'm saying yeah. yeah i mean i would love to see a mackers post yourself having mackers on the cover make it the three witches on the cover i'm There's sure some have done that i'm sure there have been but we'll get into <laughs> mackers next week i think that's it for this episode though Thank you, yes. everybody, for joining us t today, mm, tonight. Thanks for having us. Uh, we look forward to seeing everybody for our next episode of The Cup, which will be Anthony Chimolino's production of Macbeth. Yes, mm -hmm. I said the damn play name. We're not in the theater. We can say it. Yeah. Yes, we can. But Mac, oh, well, the world is a stage. Uh, <laughs> and technically, you know, virtual this virtual could be, you know, a virtual stage down the line. Well, too. I mean, nothing's falling on my head yet. I haven't have tripped and broken a leg, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> but there we go. We'll see you all next time, everybody. Uh, be sure to check out uh, Cup of Hemlock's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook pages. Jill, I'm sure they can find you at all your social media pages. Which, what are they? Yes, so um, I usually try to keep it up to date as much as possible, mm -hmm. but my artist's Instagram is Jillian with a J dot Robinson 96. Um, right. I'm also into musical theater and, and songwriting as well. So you'll yeah. see a smorgasbord of acting, singing, being a goofball mm -hmm. on my Insta. Um, Love it. Yeah, so that's where you can find my stuff. Fantastic. Ryan, where can they find you and all the sad ips and fun well, stuff? Yeah, don't even bother. Just if you like me, just follow Cup of Hamlock. Basically, just follow throw Cup of the direction. <laughs> Good. It's it. <laughs> Ryan's response is my favorite. <laughs> Love it. Ed, is there, any, is there any particular place you want people to follow you? Yeah, so please follow me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, no, you can follow me on Instagram at Edmund underscore Clark underscore official. Uh, that's my actor's page. Fantastic. And you can follow me at Mackenzie Horner or, or on all my podcast pages at Before the Downbeat. We just premiered season two as of today. So episode one drop. We officially crossed the 2,000 listens mark. So Yahoo. Fun Lovely. times there. But other than that, everybody, we'll see you next time. Enjoy. Have a great week. Say hello. Hey, hey. Have a great night. <laughs> And we'll Cheers. see you in the in the, high, in the in the Scottish Highlands for all right. <laughs> it shall be so. Tomorrow it shall and tomorrow. tomorrow. All right. <laughs> Very good. Ferris, Fallon, Fallister, Hybrid through the park, and Tilsia.